to do. President Saunders, Caribbean Court of Justice, Appellate Jurisdiction, on appeal from the Court of Appeal of Guyana. Hearing of appeal in CCG Appeal, GYCV number two of 2021, between Trust Company Guyana Limited and Guyana Securities Council. This morning's panel comprised their honors. Honorable Mr. Justice Saunders, President and the Presiding Judge. Good morning, Council. Honorable Mr. Justice Witt. Good morning, Council. Honorable Madam Justice Rajnath Lee. Good morning, Council. Honorable Mr. Justice Burgess. Good morning, Council. And Honorable Mr. Justice Jamada. Good morning, everyone. May we have the appearances, please? Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. If you please, Timothy Monroe Jonas for the Appellant Trust Company Guyana Limited. And with me is my very good friend, Mr. Taney Eric Kusti. Good morning, Your Honours. May I yes. please the court? Yes, please proceed. Thank you, Your Honour. Stephen Roberts, appearing in association with Mr. Nigel Hughes, for the respondent, please. Yes, well, good morning again, Councillor. Um, Mr. Jonas, are you ready to proceed? I hope so, sir. Can I start, sir? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Your Honours, because the documents have been filed and refiled, the page number is unclear. I believe it's page 97. But with your permission, I would like to start with the letter by the respondent dated 5th March 2010, which is, of course, the center of the controversy before your honors. The letter makes a number of statements which are not in contention. And I will ask your honors to draw the necessary inferences. The second sentence of the letter reminds Trust Company that in 2003, they'd asked to be registered as a public issuer, but they weren't qualified to be so registered. It's not in dispute between the parties that at all times up to 2007-2008, Trust Company had less than 50 shareholders and was not otherwise within the parameters of the legislation so as to be required to register. The important statement in this letter for our purposes begins with, however, according to the 2007 shareholders register, which your company provided to the council, your company had in excess of 50 shareholders 
which classifies it as a public company under the Act. Consequently, you are referred to Section 56 1 to 3 and are required to register. Your Honor, the contention of the appellants is that there are two flaws in this statement. The first flaw is the finding that trust company becomes a public company because it has an excess of 50 shareholders. The second flaw is that trust company must register as a public issuer because it is found to be a public company. Those are the two flaws which are contended by the appellant. Now, insofar as the second flaw is concerned, the second error of law, I hope to deal with this relatively quickly, Your Honours, because I suspect that more time will be spent on the question of public company. Similar to develop, sued, turn out to be. That was not me, Your Honours. I, I don't know if that was... Um... Yes, just proceed, just proceed. Thank you very much, sir. If I can refer you to page 177 of the record, um, Your Honours will forgive me, this record is mercifully brief, and therefore I'm trying not to stray outside of it. So if I'm referring to legislation, I will refer from the record. Section 56 of the Act sets out when you have to register as a reporting issuer. Section 56.1 says, from the date of commencement. Just a minute, um, you, you referred us to page 177? Yes, please, sir. I see, okay, yes, the submissions and reply, okay. Yes, please, sir, but, but only to the legislation. Yes. Section 56.1, from the date of commencement, all public companies shall become reporting issuers and shall within 90 days from the date of commencement file the paperwork. Your Honor, the contention of the appellant is that this, this is a transitional clause. It takes a specific period of time, the time of commencement, and it identifies the status quo of existing companies as at that time, as at the date of commencement. Mr. So Jones. What is the position of companies, public companies, after that 90 day period, they don't have to file that paperwork? Your Honor, if a company is not a public company then, so if as at 2002, which is the date of commencement, a company is not a public company, Section 56 1 does not apply. And therefore, a, the question of whether a company must register is answered by Section 56 2. Mr. No. Jones, uh, I don't think that point was ever made before, not before the High Court, not before the Court of Appeal, and not even before us until the reply. Isn't that so? Yes, sir. And, uh, Your Honor, I believe that every single matter should be appealed, because what happens in the appeal, and I suspect Your Honors know this better than I do, is that the issues are distilled and the arguments are focused so that you begin to see the trees rather than the forest. And mm -hmm. what happened, Your Honor, at first instance, is that the language of the letter from the Securities Council, which said, you're a public company, therefore you must register, had the result that although in the statement of claim before the Honorable Justice Barlow, both issues were pleaded, the submissions received from the respondent turned on that solely mm -hmm. on the question of public company and therefore the answer turned on the question of public company and we went down that rickety road mm -hmm. but i will respectfully point out to your honors that in fact 
what was before Justice Barlow did straddle both sections and did address both and did plead and the witness statement by Miss Williams, which is on record before your honor, did encompass both aspects. So that although your honor, the learned Justice Barlow, and with great respect to her, also went down that red herring and in her decision was clear that this case turns on whether you're a public company. Uh, Mr. Jonas, did that with this statement address this point though? And if so, could you point it out to us? Yes, please, Your Honor. Um, can I start, please, with paragraph 12 of the statement of claim, which is, Your Honor, the numbering is smudged, but I believe it is at page 58 of your record. Your Honor, please forgive my ambiguity with the numbering. Do you have paragraph 12 of the statement of claim? Yes, trust company is never distributed. Thank you very much, sir. Your, your honors will observe that that follows the concept of section 56.2. If I can refer your honors, please, to the witness statement by Deborah Williams, and I believe that is at page 66 or thereabouts of your record. Paragraph 10, please. Your, your honors will see that Ms. Williams says, we've never distributed, made any offer of shares, the fifth or more, never distributed or made offer of securities to any person for the purpose of trading, speculating as public share. So again, respectfully, within the parameters of the second limb of section 56. If I can refer you, please, to paragraph two of the submissions, which are at page seven to five, of your record. What page? Please repeat, Mr. Jonas. Seven to five, please, Your Honor, and I Thank hope you. I'm not misleading you. Is it before Your Honors? Is the submission signed by me, the first page of those submissions in the High Court? Page seven to five. Is that what you're saying? Yes, please, sir. I have it as seven five. It is entitled Written Submissions on the Part of the Plaintiff, and it is filed in Action 157 at first instance. Laid over at first instance. Do your honors have it? I'm not sure what I'm looking not for exactly. Um, at one point, I hear you to say, Page, page seven, seven to five. To five. Um, 70, sir, please forgive my accent. 70, 70 not 72. Okay. Yes, please. Do um, you want to stop it? Smudge, I'm not sure. We'll have to look into that ultimately. As you uh, please. I can read paragraph two. These are the submissions before Justice Barlow. The plaintiff respectfully agrees with statements of fact and law in the defendant's submissions, respectfully points out that the defendant does not dispute the plaintiff's witness testimony that the plaintiff has never distributed or made any offer of shares or debentures to any group of 50 persons or more. The plaintiff has never made any offer of securities to any person for the purpose of trading or speculating. The plaintiff has never issued any security which is beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. So it, it goes back to the second limb of section 56, please, Your Honor. And if I can finally refer you, please, to paragraph 12 of the decision of the Court of Appeal. Your Honor, with some hesitation, page 32 of your record. Is, is that before your honors? Paragraph 12 of the decision of the Court of Appeal. I, I have it, Mr. Jonas, but I'm not sure about my colleagues. 
they, it's not so easy to find these documents, Mr. Jonas. Is it because they were they were um, filed twice? Is that it? They were recycled. Yes, please, Your Honor. Okay, perhaps um, unless you unless. will address that. Yes. yes. Okay. Can I go on, Your Honor? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. You will observe from paragraph 12 of the decision of the Court of Appeal. From the record, it's not disputed. Apple never distributed or made any offer of shares or debentures publicly within the meaning of that. So, Your Honor, the both limbs of Section 56 were live. But I do readily say that upon receipt of the submissions by the respondent at first instance, we did go down a road, which I intend to pursue with Your Honor's permission, because I believe that equally the question of single plural in the issuing of a security um, was wrongly decided by the courts below. But insofar as the letter of the 5th of March 2010 before Your Honours is concerned, and of course what is before Your Honours is the determination of the legal propriety, whether the finding by the council was sound based on the facts relied on by the council. Insofar as trust company is concerned and this letter is concerned, if I can go back respectfully to section 56, when trust company says you're a public company, therefore, in 2010, they were wrong in law because unless you are a public company in 2002, upon the commencement of the act, Section 56.1 does not apply to you. Now, if I may at this stage respond to what Justice Saunders asked, whether if you are a public company in 2010, you should not register. Under Section 56.2 of the Act, Your Honor, Parliament assumes that what's said to be done is done. So when Parliament proclaims and tells us in 90 days we have to file for a public company, that's done. So after 90 days, you then no longer have a temporal clause. That clause has expired. You now have a situation where you deal with the ongoing statutory obligations which are created, and those are to be found, the Appellant contends, in subsection 2. A so person Mr. Who, Mr. Jonas, sorry, Mr. Jonas, in effect, you're, you're arguing that... Um, Section 56.1 is a sunset clause. Your Honor has expressed it better than I did. Yes, please. Okay. Section 56.2, which by which we are bound, says, a person who proposes to issue securities to the public shall register as a reporting issuer. That's the test. And Your Honor, um, Justice Sanders, if I may, there is, in my respectful view, an overlap. If you are going to issue securities to the public, chances are that you will, by coincidence, fall within the definition that is given of public company. Chances are. But Section 56.1, in my respectful view, described a status quo, whereas Section 56.2 describes a transaction by which you become obligated to file as a reporting issuer. And if I can go back to the letter, please. Because this is the letter. That's right. Before you go to the letter, um, can't Section 56.1 be interpreted in a way as to suggest two things? One, from the date of the commencement of the Act, or from that part, all public companies shall become reporting issuers as one thing. And secondly, all public companies that are in existence as public companies from the commencement of this part shall within 90, 90 days from that date file with the council a registration statement in the prescribed form. So that two things are captured. One, as long as you're a public company, you become a reporting issuer. Whether you are a, a public company 
at the date of commencement of the part, or you become a public company days, months, or years after the commencement. As long as you're a public company, you become a reporting issuer. And secondly, if you happen to be a public company, when the act commences, you have 90 days, because this is something that is new, to file with the council the paperwork. Can't that, can't that um, section be interpreted in that fashion? With respect, Your Honor, I, I don't think that is what the language of the section does. But I, I don't think that the overall effect of those two subsections precludes the end result of what Your Honor is suggesting. Your Honor, as I said, this has been distilled in my mind. Um, and what I believe and what I respectfully recommend to the court is that if you have a company that's 100 years old, in 2002 when the app commences. You can't trace back to look at specific transactions by which shares issued or securities issued or the benches which may have been paid off 50 years ago issued to decide if it's a public company or not. So section 56.1 is designed and the language is framed to look at a status quo rather than to analyze transactions. Whereas, so that in 2002, you look at these companies, some of which went back to the sugar days, and you say, if you have more than 50 people that own a security, you're a public company, register. If you have, please forgive me, I'm going to find the section again. If you have shares share, trading on a stock exchange or freely available to the public, register. So you are describing a state of affairs rather than analyzing transactions by which shares were issued. I think that that is a necessary approach as a practical matter for Parliament in 2002. So the Parliament catches existing companies by the status quo, by the state of affairs. But then going forward, for those companies who were not caught, Parliament then says, if you plan to issue securities, so all of those who are not caught, no, if you plan to issue securities, you must register. If you plan but to there, issue... To is, the public, isn't there a provision that defines a public company? Yes, please, sir, very much so. And that is why I suggest that the distinction that you draw as to a public company as of 2002, and then the obligations of public companies going forward may have a very similar end result. Because if you propose to issue securities to the public, you fall within the parameters of, well, nearly within the parameters of a public company, so that the no, end result the, is the same. But the definition the section, the, the, there's a section that also tells you who and what and how a company falls within the definition of a public company. So that 56.2 is not a definition section as such. 56.1, no please sir. And the definition of public company is, if you, I'm, I'm referring please to paragraph 31F of the act. Is if you what's have the page, What's the page of that um, on the record of the act? You catch me by surprise there, sir. I will try to find it quickly. Okay. I, I believe that it is quoted by Justice Barlow, in fact, in her um, decision. Okay, I can put it in her decision. Um, paragraph. 10 of the decision of the Court of Appeal at page 31, please. Paragraph 10. Yes. That's the answer? Yes. Yes. So, public company is, 
So in 2002, you check and you ask the company, have your shares or debentures been part of an offer to the public? And two, have you issued a security beneficially owned by more than 50 people? Those are the two questions that decide the public company and public company is referenced in section 56.1. So are you saying, Mr. Jonas, that this definition is limited to the app interpretation and application of 56.1? Yes, please, sir. Uh -huh. So it has no bearing in relation to 56.2? No, please, sir. I see, okay. But, and this is the important but, because we, we have to look at the intention of Parliament. The application of section 56.2, and section 56.2 is you're proposing to issue securities to the public will be that you fall under the first definition of a public company, any of whose shares or debentures are part of a distribution to the public. Are you honest with me? Sorry, repeat yourself. Although section 56.2 makes no reference to public company, the fact is that if in a perfect world, we all comply with Section 56.2. The result will be the same. Section 56.2 is transactional. It says, if you propose to issue securities to the public, if I can refer you back to the definition of public company, any of whose shares or debentures were part of a distribution to the public. So it takes you full circle back where you want to be for the protection of investors, but by a different route. Okay, but, except just, just, but, but, but Mr. Jonas, but that's that's the that's the that does not include the second part of the definition, right? No, sir. So that and what this... you are, but 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 I'm 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 a little confused. You are saying that three one F feeds into fifty six two, but you are also saying only in relation to three one F. I, I want to say one, but it's not one, but the food, yeah, one. I'm with you, sir. Thank you. Is, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. But and this three, is why. But just a minute, pause. But 32F is disjunctive. Three, yes. The language of 32F, there's an or after one. Yes, sir. So that so, in either of these two, you're a public company. Yes, but you, are say, you said to me earlier, the 32F only applies to 56.1, but, and your but was, but 32F1 applies to 56.2. Yes, sir. So how do you contrive that? Because, sir, 2 doesn't describe a transaction. It describes the state of affairs. If in 2002, and your honors, we are, we are bearing in mind, I, I am hope, which I'm sure, the intention of the act. If in 2002, we find a company that has had a debenture or a mortgage that is held a single security that is held by 50 people, chances are, even if we can't find how it was issued because it was issued 50 years ago, chances are it was issued by a public distribution. Chances are that we went to the public and said, we issue a security and 50 people subscribed. And therefore, Parliament very practically, with common sense, said we know we can't examine each transaction for all pre-existing companies. And therefore, we are saying to you that if you have a single security, but we see all of these people own it, we are going to presume that it was issued to the public and you're a public company. And that is why two exists, sir. But that presumption doesn't become necessary on a day-to-day -day basis with companies going forward because we have a record of the transactions. So 32F defining public company is designed to catch companies that have existed for 200 years in respect of which we may not know the transactions. And Parliament is saying, I'm assuming if you got 50 people that own this one security, y'all issued a share to the public. Y'all, you, you invited the public to bid. You invited the public to invest. But going forward, we do not need to make that presumption because we are saying 
that we require you under Section 56.2 if you issue securities to the public to register. And that is the difference, sir. So that it brings us full circle because the end result will be the same. It is possible. It is highly inconceivable, highly improbable. But it is possible that a company can decide, I'm going to 50 people privately in respect of one security. Highly improbable. But as soon as a company makes an offer to the public, it must register. And Parliament is assuming if you got one security owned by 50 people from 100 years ago, you made an offer to the public. That is the assumption that the second paragraph gives us, but no longer needs to be captured going forward on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of companies which are now starting up, now raising capital and making investments and making invitations to the public. Is a share a security? Yes, sir. So if a share is a security and a company has issued 50 or more shares and the beneficial ownership in those 50 or more shares is in the recipients of the shares, isn't that a public company? Your Honor, my grandfather was a policeman. By all accounts, he was a very charming man. So charming that he had 17 children. If he made a company and provided in the bylaws that only the heirs of his body may hold shares, and each of his children had two children, you will have 51 shareholders who cannot buy shares, cannot sell shares, must give the shares back to the company when they die. But according to this letter, because there are 51 shareholders, you have a public company. That cannot be the intention. The intention of the act, as we have ad nauseum gone through, and as your honors um, have not raised at all, because I, I think it's undisputed, is to protect arm's length investors who may be robbed by unscrupulous brokers or unscrupulous companies or by unscrupulous directors guilty of insider trading. And if that is the intention of the act, then the act is geared to transactions, not numbers, sir, to transactions by which a buyer is exposed to those risks which C. Lee talks about and Johnson talks about and the legislation talks about. So it cannot be a numbers game, sir. It what is? Well, you could say that, but what Parliament has what has Parliament made it a numbers game by stipulating a number? No, please, sir. You see, if if your honours agree that this concept of public company is referenced only in subparagraph one, I'm sorry, subsection one, and fifty six subsection two does not refer to public companies, then the numbers game is in 56.1. And that numbers game, Your Honor, creates a presumption that I think is a reasonable, it's an inevitable presumption, that if I'm looking at you as a company and I don't know how you did it, but I see you have a security that 50 people invested in, it is a fair bet that you offered that security to the public and those 50 people came to invest. It is a fair bet. So 51, 561, forgive me, describes the state of play at commencement. Pre-existing companies, companies that come with records intact, records lost, records sealed. Going forward, the obligations created on companies are defined by 562. Because Parliament, I, I think I understand you better now. So you're saying that <clears throat> 56 one relates to companies in existence at the date of the commencement of the act, but 56 two relates to companies that come into being after that 90 day period. Am I correct? Partly, sir. 
a company can exist before 2002, but not be a public company because only myself and Husti have a share each. So it would not fall within the definition of public company, although it existed before 2002. But Husti and I might decide in 2003, 2004, within the language of Section 56.2, that we are going to issue securities to the public. And at that stage, we are obligated to register. Okay. Uh, the, the, one of the things that is bothering me is that 56.2 speaks about what is proposed. Now, what is proposed is uniquely in the mind of the intended proposer. How does Parliament then have a law on its books to capture what the intended proposer might do? It, I, I, I don't understand how you can have legislation that is aimed at what is in the mind of an intended proposer. And that's why you have a definition section. Section 56.2 is not a definition section. The act goes out of its way to actually define public companies so that shouldn't we, rather than concentrate on 56.2, spend our time looking at whether your company falls within or outside the definition section. Your Honor, definition is only a definition and it, to give it meaning and context, we have to relate it back to the section which creates the obligation imposed on the entity which fits the definition. The and only section that speaks to the obligation is 56.1. Or, or, or is 56? And as far as I have researched and seen, 56.1 is the only section which places an obligation to report and it places it on public companies as at the commencement. Your Honor, if I can answer what you said though, um, in terms of the intention of a party, um, of course, we draw inferences of a party's intention from many means. But at 56.2, Your Honor will see that when you propose to issue security to the public, if I can refer you to Section 3.2b of the Act, the Act tells you what an offer to the public is. And of course, an offer to the public can be done quietly, sir. Um, so it says, if you make an offer to the public at large, any section of the public, and it, it, it sets out, as Your Honor says, a definition. So that the obligation exists, it's a legal obligation, and if you're making an offer to the public, then on the six, section 61 to 63, you have to file a prospectus with the council, you have to make public disclosures, because the public need to be protected if they are going to invest as an arm's length transaction within the language of Seeley and Johnson in their texts. But my grandfather's grandchildren do not need protection, sir, even if there are 51 of them. And that is why, with great respect, it's not simplicity to numbers. Where you are dealing with a public company, it is quite fair for Parliament to presume if it sees a single security held by held by a lot of people, those people probably were invited to invest. It's a fair assumption, because otherwise, I cannot conceive another way to bring the pre-existing companies 100 years old into the fold. So you define public company by status quo. But going forward, where we have obligations, intention or not, sir, because intention is mens rea, it's nothing more. Intention or not, if you propose to issue a security to the public, you must register. According to the letter from Securities Council, there is no reference whatsoever made to whether 
trust company issued or proposed to issue securities to the public. The Securities Council letter says, you're a public company, why? Because you got more than 51 share, more than 50 shareholders. You're ignoring how you got those shareholders, it's a numbers game. And the Appellant's respectful contention, sir, is that there are two flaws facing us, two errors of law. First, unless I was a public company in 2002, when Section 56.1 kicked in, if I was not a public company then, I'm not under Section 56.1. And in its letter, Securities Council specifically says, 2003, you asked and you couldn't do it. You asked to register and you weren't qualified. So we are now on the second limb, 56.2, because we know that within 90 days of 56.1, within 90 days are set out, we were not a public company within that la the language of that act, of that section. So the next question arises, did we offer shares to the public within section 56.2? But the Securities Council doesn't approach that and specifically ignores that. There is no inquiry whether there was a pub, an offer to the public. There's no inquiry about anything except your shareholding went over 50. And therefore, under the 56.1, which no longer applies because we're in 2010, you're a public company. So the error was twofold. And unfortunately, as Justice Rajnath Lee pointed out, the attention of the court at first instance and the attention of the court of appeal focused on definitions of public company. Your honors, if you find that there is nothing before the Securities Council to show that they considered whether or not there was an issue of securities to the public between 2003 and 2010. And if your honors agree that in fact this letter specifically shows the trust that Securities Council was considering something completely different from whether there was a public issue of securities during that time frame, then this letter is legally erroneous and the Securities Council acted ultra virus when it issued the letter. Mr. Jones, Jones, may I ask you, sorry. sorry. No, yeah, you, you sorry, go Mr. ahead, Jones, Judge. I think that the president raised a question with you, which, which you haven't uh, addressed. Assuming that we do not, that one does not agree that 56.1 is a sunset clause, let's, let's assume that that is not accepted. Uh, does trust company fall within the definition of, um, of public company pursuant to uh, Section 3.1.F.2? Your Honor, that I hope will be the focus of the greater part of my submission. Because although this letter is wrong by failing to segregate Section 56.1 and 56.2, I still believe and I argued, and I do respectfully ask this court to consider the question, even though it may become um, a non-issue, that a public company defined by Section 312F must be defined by referring that language security where 50 people hold a security to a single security, not plural. And if that is the case, then although it may not apply to trust company, or it may, depending on your Honor's point of view, trust company and no other company is a public company by virtue simplicity of the fact that it has 51 shareholders. That cannot be the case, but that would be the effect of interpreting the definition of public company as the courts below have done. Just a moment, let me see if I understand you. You're saying that um, 3.1.F.2 relates to the issuance of 
a single security that is beneficially owned by more than 50 persons as yes, distinct sir. from several securities, each of which 50 or more securities, each of which is owned by more than 50 persons. Forgive me, sorry, I interrupted you. I, I spoke too quickly. But no, 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 no. Um, I, I, I think I, it, I understand you to be saying, and the clear language is in the singular, that a public company means two. A company that is the issuer of a, and I put in the word, single security that is beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. And I understand you to be saying that is how this is to be interpreted as distinct from an interpretation that says a public company means a company that is the issuer of securities that are beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. You make a distinction between those two forms of interpretation. Very much so. In, in so what instance would there be a... And all the other legislation referred to by the respondents from around the world. Contemplate a situation, and Sealy does as well, where I issue a security to a broker, he owns that beneficially. But his job, and he makes his profit by splitting it up and selling units or selling parts of that security to investors. So, um, so Mr. John, sorry. So, Mr. Jonas, while you're contemplating that, uh, and I'm just piggybacking on the president's um, uh, question, the share capital of trust company, isn't that a security? A security? Uh, am I wrong for believing that the share capital from which shares are issued is a security? And am I wrong for believing that that is generally regarded as a, as a security? If you go in this, in, on, on the securities market, uh, one of the things you find is equity securities that uh, companies give their share capital as a security, don't they? Your Honor, the <laughs> I am answering a question to the author of the book, but they do not give the securities. They do not give the capital, sir. What they give is a promise. And the security is a promise. A share is a promise. A debenture is a promise. They give a, a promise. So the capital and, and itself. The share capital is a, is a promise as well, isn't it? Once it is given as a promise, yes. But I believe capital is money in a bank, sir. Sorry. Uh, share capital. Uh, we are talking. We are talking about share capital. Um, yes, and yes, that, that is what that is what backs a company, isn't it? Isn't yes, that please. what? Isn't that what investors in the company are looking to? The share yes. capital. Of, so isn't that a security? It, yes, sir, it can be, certainly. Yeah, so that doesn't have to be plural, does it? The, the share capital is the is the, the corpus of, of, of capital which is raised by the company, isn't it? Yes, sir, but if we can go down your your line of argument. There's, no, line, there's no argument on my part. I'm raising questions with you, uh, Mr. Jonas. Forgive my language, sir. It, it, it was not intended to suggest that. A share represents a fraction that is owned by that shareholder. So that share... A fraction of the capital of the company, isn't it? Yes, please, sir, but a fraction is still a fraction. So a shareholder does not claim by virtue of his single share to own all the share capital. He no, owns we are looking at the companies, we are looking at the company, your, your, your argument is that the company did not issue from any single security and the president i'm using the, the president's word because single is not included in the definition your argument is that there were shares which were issued and shares which are owned but that is not a security from this come uh, if you want to read biblical from whence cometh the the shares not from the share capital which is a single uh, 
a, a body of, of capital uh, your, your Honor, a single security? I think what you're doing, Your Honor, is um, what, what that question suggests is equating the share as if it were the share capital. But the share... If, if, if you understand me to be saying that, Miss, and I'm sorry to be to be uh, interrupting you, I'm very sorry about that, but just to, to make it clear that the share is issued from the share capital, but the share is not the share capital, it's an adequate part, as you correctly pointed out, of the share capital. The only question which I'm raising with you is this. Your argument seems to be that shares, not a share, uh, were issued, and therefore there was no security, single security, from which uh, the shares were issued. That appears to me to be your argument. What I'm wondering aloud is whether the share capital of the company from this cometh the shares, whether this is not a security as it is usually regarded to be. Your Honor, I believe that a company can say to the public, our capital worth, and I'm avoiding the expression share capital, our worth is $100. And we are therefore offering units or sections or any word they want to use that reflects that worth. The normal convention, as I understand it, is that the company issues shares reflecting that total worth. Now, the value of the shares may go up and down, although the share capital might remain the same. But what you own as a shareholder is not share capital as I see it, sir, and I'm subject to correction. To me, what you own is the promise by the company represented in that share certificate in your hand, which is a statement by the company, that you have two shares in this company. And those two shares may well reflect a value of the company as a whole. I hope it does. But you are the owner of shares, and your share is a security. Yes, but what you're... Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no, no. Uh, please go ahead, Justice um, Burgess. Mm -hmm. yeah, th thanks very much, Justice uh, Rashid Lee. Uh, Mr. Jonas, is it the share uh, as issued, issued from a security, a single security, which is the share capital? That's the question which I'm trying to, to, to wonder. I, I don't know the answer, but nope. I'm wondering whether the share can be viewed as anything other. Remember the definition, section, the definition in section three? A security is wouldn't a shareholder be considered as a person he, who owns uh, something in a security? No, please, sir. To me, the shareholder holds a security, which is the share. That as well, yes, of course, he, he, he owns a security, but the security is an adequate part of a bigger of, 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 a, of a single security, which is the share capital, isn't it? Well. Your Honor, if that share capital has not been offered to anyone, it's not a security. A security is something which you hold as a promise for a payment. A security is something like a mortgage that is given to you as, secu as, as security. And therefore, the share is the written declaration by the company as to your ownership of this proportion. And that share is the security. But if the share relates back, as we know it does, to share capital, which represents the value of the company, I don't see that that share capital, which hasn't been promised to, to anybody, that share capital is a number. I don't see that that is a security unless some kind of interest in it is offered to a third party to secure a benefit. Um, on a slightly different note, but on the same issue, Mr. Uh, Jonas, from what I understand that you're saying is that this section is only triggered if a single share is owned by more than 50 persons? Well, share would treat it too narrowly, Your Honor. It could be any interest. So it could yes, be no, no. I, I'll take you to the definition and you could take us there to the definition of security under the Act. So I would prefer that, please. They're all, they're all in the singular. 
But what I'm asking is if we put share there, if we put instead of security, because share means, security means that it includes in the definition share. So is that your argument, Russ, that this is a, it must be only a single share that is owned beneficially by more than 50 persons? Your Honor, although to answer that simply, I believe, might have the, might lead to a wrong inference. You see, we all have a preconception of what a share is. We all, I hope, may have a share or two in a company. But the word share is not magic. A share could, you could issue a debenture and call it a share. You could issue a unit and call it a share. So that word share, if we treat it with our own preconception that I got shares in a company, it, it leads to a result that I don't think Parliament intends. Parliament but says- Mr. 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 Jules, let, let me just stop you. We got take us to security because security also includes a bond, a debenture and so on. So if you could take us there, that may be helpful, but it also includes in that definition a share. So I ask the question again, let's think narrowly about a share because this is what the case is about. It's not about the benches, not about bonds. It's about shares issued to more than 50 persons or are you right that it is about a single share? That must be the trigger that is owned by more than 50 persons. Your Honor, it's about a security, and in this case, in which will include a share. Yes, go ahead. A security, security we're has. referring to as a share. But if you treat the singular in this case as including the plural, the effect of what you are doing is to change the nature and meaning and effect of all the transactions under review, and by doing so, you are defeating the intention of the act which is the protection of the public. But you see, you, you, you reference the, what you regard to be the purpose of the act and the restriction or the stricture placed on public companies um, to the definition of public company. And I'm wondering whether that is an appropriate way of going about it. Couldn't the legislature take the view that, look, once you're over 50 security owners, we're going to deem you to be a public company. Even if, as long as those 50 persons beneficially own the security that the company gives to them. Um, so that even if a man has, uh, your example, you know, um, 17 children, and each of those children have 17 children. And the man says, look, I'm going to make all my family members shareholders in this very profitable company that I have. And when you do all the math, there are more than 50 of them. The, 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 the legislature says, too bad, sorry over 50 persons, we are going to treat you as a public company, as distinct from whether the legislature is saying that, well, no, these are all family members, and so there's no need to protect members of the public. They're not, they've not gone outside a close family bond, and therefore they are not to be deemed to be public company. You seem to be saying the latter. And I'm saying, on what basis can it be said that a clear statement in the definition section that references the former, namely, we are not concerned about the identity of these 50 persons. We are not concerned about the relationship of these 50 persons to each other. As long as you hit 50 and you've gone, you've exceeded that, we are going to deem the business that you have, the company that you have, a public company. Why isn't that a legitimate approach to interpreting this definition? Five reasons, sir. The first reason to me is the 
obvious one and made more obvious by your clear language. You said, why can't we interpret this that if you have more than 50 shareholders, you're a public company? Your Honor, the clarity of that language can be subject to criticism. Why didn't Parliament say that? Parliament said that in Antigua. And if I can refer you please to page 178, paragraph 5, 178 of your record, paragraph 5. Oh, Mr. Jonas, wait, are you saying that the first reason, I'm taking your five reasons, the first reason is because the, the section does not say that? No, please, sir. I'm saying that it could have so easily be said, been said in very simple language, as Justice Saunders just did, and as the legislation in Antigua does. Although it's different legislation, and therefore I don't believe it's helpful, when we do a no, comparison. No, 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 but, yeah, but it's, I'm just trying to get the reasons before you yes. get into the elaboration. Is the first reason that the language in this act does not say so clearly? Yes, please, sir. Right. Okay, so good. You can elaborate can I, can now. I, elaborate I just want to get the reasons succinctly, and then we can take the elaboration. So the first reason why we should not interpret this definition to mean once you have more than 50, 50 persons, a public company is because A, the language does not say so clearly as in Antigua. Yes, please, sir. And if I may elaborate. It defeats the clear words of the act to take a, an interpretation which has a difficult result where it's so clear that the same thing could have been said so simply. And there has the, to be more to it clarity, than that. The, the lack of clarity resides in the fact that security there is in the singular and not the, 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 the plural. On the contrary, sir. I believe that that is what makes it so clear. You see, in the previous paragraph, the plural is used. Yes. You talk about Roman one, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jonas. Yes, please, Your Any Honor. of whose issued shares or debentures are or part of a distribution, yes. one offered to the public. So you're saying that it would, would have been easy for Parliament to say any of whose issued shares are, be, are held by more than 50 persons. Is that what you're suggesting Parliament could have said or something like it? If in this clause, singular equals plural, Parliament could have said which issued the debenture as part of a distribution. Not any of whose, because you don't have to take out some of them, any of those debentures which issued a debenture, which is part of a public distribution. But they didn't do that. They segregated. They showed that some securities could be issued privately, some could be issued publicly. They acknowledged the transactional underpinning of this act, which is that I have 100 shares, I can separate 50 of them and issue them privately, any of whose issued shares are debentures. The other 50 I might have issued by a public offer and therefore I'm a public company. But the underpinning is the transaction. That's it. You, That's you, you, are, of the, you are in the language of 56, right? Not 32F. Which yes, language are you in? 32F. 32F1, please. Right. Any of whose issued shares are debentures. Parliament is saying it doesn't have to be all of them. You could have issued some privately. Parliament is recognizing the transactional basis upon which the act is up is up, becomes operational. The nature by which you issued. So maybe I issued some privately. When we see a nice starting company, we may both hold shares privately. When we decide to go public, some of our shares are now issued publicly. We become a public company. The transaction is important. And when we do that, Your Honor, we may only get 20 investors. 
but we're still a public company. Right, it has that's nothing F1. to do with numbers. Yes, please. That's F1. Fair enough. Yes. But we're debating F2, Mr. Jonas. Well, well, Your Honours, you had asked me why, and you had then asked me, uh, I think um, you had done that, Madam Justice Rajnath Lee, I, I apologize if it was not you, but about the reference to any of who's issued shares. Mm -hmm. But going back to Roman numeral two, in contradistinction to one, which considers a transaction, Two, and please bear in mind, this definition pertains back to Section 56.1, which is seeking to capture pre-existing companies without knowing, possibly because the records are lost, without knowing how you got your investors. And two, which pertains back to Section 56.1, says to those old companies, look, if you got a debenture, or you got a bond, or you got a security, and with great respect, if you happen to call that security a share, not shares, then we are going to assume it was a public offer by which you got those investors on board. It's a common sense approach that Parliament took in 2002 to capture pre-existing transactions which may not have been transparent because of age, loss of documents, whatever. Uh, Mr. Jonas, I, I, sorry. Why do you say that this relates back to 56.1? Because it is only 56.1 that uses the expression public company, Your Honor. 56.2 does not use the expression public company. So both 1 and 2 refer back to 56.1 then, Mr. Jonas. That's what, that's yes, what you're please. saying, because what? both are public companies. Yes, mm -hmm. please. But to go back to what Justice Sanders had asked previously, when you then move forward, all the public companies pre-existing having been captured, and you start bringing new companies or new transactions into the net on the Section 56.2. The end result is very similar in respect of those new companies, because if those new companies issue a security, security, including a share, to more than 50 people, chances are it's a public company. Chances are it was an offer to the public. So the end result is the same, but the machinery by which you capture the old companies had to be different and therefore was accommodated by 56.1. That is why public company is important because it appertains to 56.1. It helps resolve status quo rather than the transaction, the nature of the transaction. Mr. Jonas, there's something I want to ask you, and I know this is just the first of the five reasons you want to give us, but you speak we have been exploring at length uh this transactional and um and and um transitory nature of 56.1 versus 56.2 and 32f1 as it two as it applies etc um if this section is in any way uncertain or ambiguous uh, under the Pepper and Hart rule, have you had a look at the debates in Hansard or in the Parliament, the parliamentary records, as to the mover of this? Because if what you are saying is right, one would think that the mover of the legislation would have said very clearly, well, I am, as you know, in Parliament, you go through section by section and you say, in relation to this, this is put in here. For, as a transition uh, provision for the purposes of, as you say, capturing all companies. Because, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the House or whatever it is, you know we have all companies. In other words, Mr. Jonas's speech that you have given us at least three times now. Fair enough. <laughs> My point is very simple, Mr. Jonas. The Pepper and Hart rule would seemingly be apt in this case and if that is so and you this is a pure question of statutory interpretation what does the Hansard and in particular the speeches of the move of the legislation whether in the house and maybe my language is wrong in the assembly I think it is in Guyana forgive me in the assembly or at the committee stage if this went to committee stage what does that do 
where is the no where is the, that evidence because you are asking us to do something that the legislation is not saying it does on the face of it the legislation you are asking us to interpret the legislation to say that 56 1 is a transition provision it does not say so itself and you have at length described why that is a rational approach. But what does the record in, in, in the assembly say about this? Why should we not have resort to that? And why have you not, have you searched it up? Does it support you? Does the mover say this was the intention? That is an aid to interpretation where legislation uh, is on the face of it or in our debate on it um, uh, ambiguous the language or uncertain or unclear is that not so my question is have you done that research uh, and what does that research reveal I don't know if my colleagues are open to receiving that evidence given your submissions I certainly assume that you've done that research and you can answer us but maybe I will leave it for the president to comment as to whether or not um, my inquiry should be, uh, an answer to my inquiry should be allowed, i.e. to move into the pepper, realm of pepper and heart. What, what's your response, Mr. Jonas? Do you have any response? Your Honor, you will forgive me a certain degree of skepticism. To answer your question, I have not inquired. In my experience, one of the great ironies of our democracy is that legislation borrowed, touched up, and placed before Parliament. Um, that group of politicians in Parliament may not be subject to the kind of scrutiny that Your Honours is now subjecting two very small and on the face of it inconsequential subparagraphs. So I say skepticism because I would wager that a member of parliament did not isolate section 56.1 and 56.2 to say, why are we doing it this way? So the answer to your question, sir, is no, but it is accompanied, although in a perfect world, that would be the solution inevitably by a degree of skepticism as to what I would find. Yes. It, it doesn't appease my curiosity because I think if we are debating the meaning of a statute passed by a sovereign parliament, one assumes that the parliament intends and knows what it intends and if, as you say, the intention was that this was to have, as our brother Justice Burgess has said, a sunset clause, that is a very well-known um, uh, method or technique in legislation. And somebody may very likely have said, sections, uh, as we go through members of the assembly, section so-and-so is intended to be a, tran a, tra a, tra a transition clause, and it has um, a window. It is intended because, as you know, there are companies 200 years old, and so as a policy, we are saying anybody with 50 deemed to be public, they must register within 90 days. And they move on. That's... I, one would assume that you, if that was what they intended, that explanation would have been offered to the assembly. So members of the assembly would know that what they were passing here was, uh, as you describe it, a clear and obvious uh, transition clause with a window of 90 days, a sunset, the sunset in 90 days. That's nothing not new to, to, to our kinds of um, le uh, legislatures, but you haven't researched it, maybe Maybe those on the other side have and can help me. Can I respectfully point out, sir, that I don't believe it leads to an ambiguity. Section 56.1 is quite clear in itself in my respectful view. I it's know that, that is your submission. Yes. And I will not say it a fourth time, Your Honor. I take your injunction very well. But in contradistinction to Section 56.2, 
Only one inference can be drawn in my respectful view. And on the ordinary language of the two sex subsections vis-a-vis -vis each other, I believe that the effect, the overall holistic effect is clear. If you have breached Section 56.1 as a public company by failing to register, you've broken the law. But I don't think that that translates to extending the definition of Section 56.1 beyond what the clear language into my mind intends. I don't think it creates an ambiguity. I think that moving forward, you do what Section 56.2 tells you. Um, I, I want to ask you two, two direct questions. One, um, do you accept that every public company is a reporting issuer? Sir, no, I do not. I accept that every public company which fell into that definition as of July 2002 is a reporting issuer. But so, I... I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Um, so you, in your view, it is possible that there can be a public company which is absolved from or does not have to abide by the impositions, the obligations of reporting issuers? I think it is highly unlikely. I think that in that Venn diagram, where you identify public companies as at 2002, and then you, you identify- keep referencing as at 2002. I, I'm, not, I'm not restricting the question that I asked to any particular date. Just generally, as at this time, for example. Um, I think I'll answer your question though, sir. I, I think where I'm going will answer your question. Okay, so not all public companies are deemed are or are deemed to be reporting issuers. Um, if I can use my analogy of the Venn diagram, sir, you see, the what conceivably can happen, but what is very likely to happen are two different things. So if I can use my Venn diagram, if you have the group of companies as at 2002 that were public companies. And then you have the group of companies that after 2002 issued securities to the public. It is a 99% chance that both will fall within the definition of public company as set out in F1 or F2. The end result will be the same. But, but the, no, 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 no. Your, your argument must be F1. Mm -hmm. Because you see, your argument is that F2 facilitates the transition and expired on the 90 day anniversary. Post 2002, your argument is only F1 applies. Is that not so, Mr. Jonas? Yes, sir, but yes. I think with great respect that what I am not explaining properly, what mm -hmm. I'm not explaining well, is that if the situation and the transaction is that you have a single security owned by 50 people, then inevitably 99% chance sure that that was accomplished by an offer to the public. So even in the Venn diagram category of companies which issued securities to the public, they may end up issuing by a limited offer, give it to a broker and he splits it up. They may end up showing that they have a security, whether it's a bond or a debenture or a unit, that is owned by more than 50 people. That transaction can lead to this end result. And therefore, a company since 2002. So therefore, Mr. Jonas, therefore, Mr. Jonas, F2, F2 can describe a transaction also. No, please, sir. A single security issued 
the beneficial interest of which is issued to 50 or more persons. No, please, sir. That's not descriptive of a transaction or a series of transactions? No, please, sir. No. That okay. is the uh, end result. That describes an end result. You right. have so the end result. The end result of what? Your a knowledge. transaction or series of transactions? No, it's, yes. it's, if, it's a fair presumption to draw, a fair inference to draw, if you see that share owned by 50 people, that it was done by a public offer. But it's not the inevitable. It's not the only way it could be done, sir. You can go to 49 friends who are all sophisticated, who are all close family members, who are, who are all named Jamadar, sir. You can go to them. And by a private arrangement with each of them, that is not a public offer and by which they cannot sell or put on a stock market, you can issue to them a portion of your single security so that the end result will be a security held by 50 people, but not by a public offering. So although it's highly unlikely, it is possible. And this is the distinction I'm trying to draw, sir. Okay. Because unfortunately, the vagaries of the English language are inexact. But I don't think that we should try to lump it all into the set that because I see this year, it means necessarily I did a public offer. Okay, there, there's one other question. I, I, I understand you. There, there, there's one other question I, I, I need to ask you, and that is, so far we've been talking in fairly abstract terms. Um, you, the company in question here, as of 2010 when that letter was written, how many shareholders did it have? I believe it had gone down from 60 but your honor i don't i cannot tell you and i will not contend because i i don't think it, it moves us that it was less than 50. i know it's less than 50 today okay but right. um at so the time in, it may have in, been 50 or 10, the likelihood is that it was it might have exceeded 50. at that did time those, yes, sir. yeah did those shareholders own the beneficial interests of the shares they held your Honor, I, I wish that the Securities Council had asked these questions, <laughs> but to do my best to answer them, some of these shares... Well, no, wait, 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 before you answer, let me rephrase the question. <laughs> Is there any evidence on the record to establish who owned the beneficial interest of those shares? Your Honor, I can only say that from the record, and I cannot point you immediately, 11 of them at least were employees, part, part of the arrangement the trust company has. Um, and I, I say this off the record as a longstanding lawyer of trust company, that a, an employee retires, you, you're entitled to take, a, take some shares. So it's, it's, it's part of a part of a benefit that's given to employees, but the... Right, so, and let's see how this works in practice. The, you retire, you, you, you get some shares. What's the value of those shares? It, 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 does, what is the tangible benefit of having those shares? Is there Remember, any tangible benefit? I am sure that there is. I've never heard of anyone refusing, but I don't know what it is. But Your Honor, with great respect, that and is that, the question. That that tangible benefit is um, is owned. It is received. It is it accrues to the particular person, the retiree. Well, dividends, Your Honor. I don't know the details. Yeah, but, but fact, but fact. The, the point I, I'm simply getting at is that it doesn't appear that there is anything on the record to contradict the view that the shareholders were the beneficial owners of the shares that resided in their respective names. It isn't a case that they were nominee shareholders and whatever benefit, interest, dividend, or otherwise that share yielded belonged to somebody else. Perhaps not, sir. Well, what, what there is and what is unambiguous and clear is the letter from the Securities Council 
which does not ask that, does not make a finding of that, does not make any determination as mm. to any of the questions contained in Section 56. Yeah, but, but you see, and I'm sorry. That, um, it, it is not for them so much to ask those questions, but for the person who is putting the conclusions they draw to produce evidence to show that those conclusions are skewed. But Your Honor, Your Honor with great respect, you have a public authority, a statutory body, who informs the world, all and sundry, and informs this court, not just of its conclusion, but of the reason it reached its conclusion. And if the reason it reached its conclusion is legally fallacious, then there is only one end result. The other questions Your Honor asked should have been asked, and more than that, more questions than that should have been asked, so that a proper exercise of discretion and a proper legal finding could have been made on the Section 56-2, specifically and expressly. I'm sorry, sir. It, it, it all depends on the, in, in, the, the, what is the right interpretation. Your interpretation is a very purposive one. And if that is the correct interpretation, then yes, those questions are important. It is important that the statutory body should ask those questions in order to arrive at the proper conclusions. But if, in fact, the interpretive exercise is... Um, resides in a literal, um, it's a literal one where, as somebody you said earlier, we play in a numbers game, then they simply look at numbers and draw their conclusion from numbers. And they say, okay, you over 50, so bingo, um, you are a reporting issue. And then it, the burden would then fall on a particular company. They say, no, 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 no. That is what it's seen. But for X, Y, Z reasons, you know. But anyhow, Mr. Jonas, um, you have five more minutes. Um, you Preston, us, uh, yes. I would like to ask a question. Sure. Um, if uh, you please, sir. I, I'm yeah. sorry, but may, may I respond to what Justice Saunders said? Um, just for two seconds. You mm -hmm. see, I don't believe my interpretation is purposive. I believe my interpretation is literal. There is absolutely nothing in this act that says a public company in 2010 must register. I'm, yes, please, Justice Witt, please forgive that interruption. No, no, uh, well, that goes into the, into the direction of what I want to ask. Uh, it seems to me that you are saying that the, uh, the Act imposes obligations not on public companies, but on reporting issuers. Um, and that what we have to understand by a, a, a reporting issuer um, in the first period, first 90 days, that would capture, um, of course, those who would uh, issue securities to the public, uh, the first part of the definition, uh, but it would also include uh, the those companies with uh, a security owned, beneficially owned by more than 50 uh, persons. Um, after that, as I understand you, um, what simply, uh, what, so if, if, if the company, if the trust company did fall into that, uh, in, into that definition of public uh, company, and then it would have been a reporting issuer. Um, after that period, it's only those who fall under 56-2 who can be considered reporting issuers. Is that is that what you're saying? Exactly, with one addition, please, sir. Or mm -hmm. those who breached 56-1 back in 2002. Yeah, sure. So then my question would be, uh, okay, then <clears throat> we're going back to that definition of security. Is that one security? Would that mean in terms of shares, one share? Or could it be more shares? Suppose it would mean more shares, or it would include more shares. In that period, that first 90 days, uh, would they, this particular company have complied with that definition under under two 
I mean, would that would at that point in time would it have been a company with more than fifty shareholders? Trust company, sir. Yes, Your Honor, the same letter by the Securities Council specifically points out that on in 2003, this same trust company said we want to register and this same trust company was told you are not qualified as at that date to be registered. However, since then you got more than 50 shareholders. Uh -huh. And you were saying, well, that 50 shareholders thing, uh, that, that would have been a point if that had been the case in the first 90 days from the date of commencement, but thereafter it is not really relevant. For is trust companies, for trust companies' purposes, it is not because trust company would then have to be assessed under 56.2. But your honor, as a larger concept of statutory construction, trust company aside, mm -hmm. I am asking this court to consider and to find that even if company X in 2002 had 51 shareholders. The company is called Jonas Incorporated. My grandfather and his the heirs of um, his heirs' tail, his fee tail. Yes. That company would not automatically be a public company within Roman numeral two, because the expression in Roman numeral two, issuer of a security, has got to be deemed to be singular. And as I said, I have five reasons for that, which I know Justice Jamadar is patiently waiting to hear. Okay, well, let's have the other four then. If I may, Justice Jamadar, um, you've dealt with the first one. No, you have. <laughs> it's, it's your reasons. <laughs> Your Honor, sometimes they say that the teacher deals with the student and you say, no, it's your behavior. The second reason, sir, is that the use of the plural was specifically used, as Justice Rajnath Lee pointed out, in Roman numeral one. And the use of the singular is specifically used in Roman numeral two. Now, your Honor, if I can refer you, please, to page 78 of your record. This is submissions at first instance before Justice Barlow. I hope it's 78, Your Honor. It might be 79. It is a paragraph 9 of those submissions. Can I move on, Your Honor? Yes. I pointed out to Justice Barlow, Section 6 of the Interpretation Act, which de deals with that singular um, plural conundrum. In any written law, unless the context otherwise required, words in the singular shall include plural, words in the plural shall include the singular. So we have to consider the context. So there are, aside from the ease with, with which, as Justice Jamadar heard me deal with, um, the language could have been used to simplify what is a complicated clause. And aside from the fact that the plural was used in Roman numeral one in contradistinction to the singular in Roman numeral two, which I respectfully submit provides context. What was pointed out to the learned Justice Barlow was the discussion by the Privy Council in Blue Metal Industries. And Your Honours, I, I just want to point Your Honours to the last four lines of the quote. The, the court says, I hope Your Honours are with me, it's just above my scroll, my signature. And that's page what? Seven to eight, please, sir. The last page of, of my submissions at first instance, paragraph 10 going into paragraph 11. It is lesson well learned, Your Honours. I will not recycle paperwork to file, but these were filed 
at the application stage, and therefore the page number is blurred. Uh, yeah. Do you want us have it? Go ahead. Go ahead. The Privy Council says, and and this is um where legislation contemplated a transfer of shares on a takeover involving the transfer of shares to another company. And the question was whether this meant a singular company or more than one company. And examining the facts, this is what was said. The Interpretation Act is a drafting convenience. And Your Honours, I want to emphasize that it's a convenience. Without Section 6 of the Interpretation Act, Parliament would have to say men, man and men, women and women. It would have to specify singular and plural. But that convenience, it is not to be expected that it would be used so as to change the character of legislation. If you say a man shall not kill, of course you mean men shall not kill. And of course you mean men and women shall not kill. You haven't changed the meaning of the transaction. You have, as a matter of legislative convenience, included plural and singular, whereby pretending that singular includes plural, you change the nature of the transaction entirely, you are no longer relying on legislative convenience. You are then drafting legislation yourself. It is very different when you say, if you have a share, and if 50 people hold a share, those are two very different contemplations. And if I can refer, Your Honor, to Seeley at page 153 of your record, mercifully clear. Paragraph four of our submissions. Can I go on, Your Honor? Yes. Seeley describes the nature of the transactions which it is sought to protect against. So first, he says, direct offer to the public, prospectus, it all, all and sundry, come and buy. The second one, offer for sale, where an issuing house subscribes for the whole of the issue, then invites the public to buy. So Husti and Jonas create this company, issue a bond to a single entity, a single publishing um, house, and that house, being the single beneficial owner, sells portions. So that at the end of the day, you have 51 owners of this single security, whether it is a bond, whether it is a debenture, whether it is a share, I do not care. That is what is sought to be protected. And that transaction is specifically contemplated in Section 62 of the Act, which talks about limited offers. And limited offer is an offer to a small number of people made with the intention that they will resell. So when we talk about the issuer of a security beneficially owned by many people, we are contemplating transactions which are public offers. We are contemplating limited offers. We are contemplating the offer to an issuing house that Seeley describes, all of which this act is designed to safeguard against because it exposes arm's length investors who are innocent sheep on the road from being exploited by the company with insider knowledge. It is the transaction that is sought to be protected. And therefore, if we pretend that singular equals plural, so that my poor grandfather's fifth to one grandchildren fall within this, although they never bought a share or sold a share. And although when they die, the shares go back to the company, just because he was profligate in his activities, your honors, um, we have defeated the purpose of the act. And therefore, following section six, of the Interpretation Act, the context of this requires that we treat it as singular or else we change the meaning, we change the transaction. That's the second, I'm sorry, sir, that's the third.
Your Honor, I waxed on lyrical and I covered two, three, and four in that one. So I think that's the end because the first was the one raised by Justice Saunders, which dealt with the simplicity of the language, which otherwise could be used, rather than this complicated thing that says, um, issue of a security beneficially owned by more than 50 persons, why not say 50 shareholders? So those are the reasons, please. So I believe with great respect that trust company does not fall within section 56.2 and the trust company is because, not. Because? Because it is not alleged. Within 56.1? I can start there if you wish, please, Your Honor. What, should I start there? Yes, please. Trust company does not fall within 56.1 because, as at the commencement, it was not a public company within the language. No, two, because at 2002, it was not a public company. Because at 2002, it was not a public company. Mm -hmm. Yes, please, sir, at the commencement. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry if I didn't express that. And it doesn't <laughs> fall within two because it never issued a single security which was then offered to the public and Your Honor, became owned you ask, by more than 50 persons. Your Honor, you are asking me to give evidence um, from the bar table. Now, of my knowledge, I know the trust company does not sh trade its shares, but that is not before Your Honor. What is before Your Honor is the specific finding of the statutory authority, <coughs> the Securities Council, that said didn't say what your honor just said, didn't talk about section 56.2 and say you didn't, you, you issued shares to the public or you issued securities to the public. Trust, um, Securities Council didn't do that. Securities Council said numbers by some means or other, which we are not inquiring. Although before 2007, you had less than 49 shareholders. Now you're gone up to 50 something. And we don't but care. We don't know how you got them. How is the council to know the difference between a company, and I, I, I take your point, I understand the point that you're making. How is the council to know the difference between a company who issues directly 50 or more of its shares from a company that issues a security, which it then, the, 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 is, the person to whom it is issued then permits or offers to the public for by, more than 50 persons to... By asking, sir. The council has extremely wide powers under the Act. And this same letter points out, although it, did, it wasn't specifically central in focus, that trust company had to give them their share register every year. The Securities Council has wide powers and can go to any company and say, give me your record, show me how this happened, show me how that happened by asking. That is why it's a statutory authority, sir. And if it finds you fallen within its trap, it tells you to register. Here, it told trust company to register having considered entirely erroneous um, factors in the exercise of its discretion. So we, we, we get back to the situation where the council is not entitled simply to look at how many shares a company has and to conclude from that that it is a public company. It must no, do please. more. Correct, please, sir. And, and with, with great respect, can I use the same example of trust company? In 2002, it's got four to five shareholders. We don't know how it got those shares, but the Securities Council say you're a private company. It gets 10 shareholders subsequently. <laughs> Now, chances are that was not an offer to the public, Your Honor. And chances are it was not part of the same transaction by which those pre-existing shareholders bought shares. Ten shareholders, that's all. But by that magic, becomes a public company. That cannot be the case. That cannot be the intention of Parliament, which is designed to protect investors, and which itself gives definitions of public offerings as creating a presumption if it's made to more than 50 people using that, that size, but always relying on the nature of the transaction, not the number simplistically. Okay, Mr. Jonas, we've indulged you for well beyond the normal time that we, we should have. Is there anything further that you wish to say in a minute? I'm, I'm very grateful for your patience, sir.
Is there anything further that you oh, wish no, to? No, please, sir. No, please. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what. Um, before we hear you, Mr. Roberts, um, why don't we take um, a, a three minute break? Uh, and, President, um, can I ask that we take a 10 minute break? I have 10 minute break. Yes, okay, please. Sure. Thank you very much. I appreciate sure. it. Yeah, we'll come back in 10 minutes. That's about 11.53 or so. Very grateful to you, honest. May I ask if we should disengage and join the link again, or if we should just you, pause it? No, you should stay on the link, um, but you can mute your, you must mute your microphone and you may take off, I suggest you take off your camera. Thank you very much, sir. We will. Thank you, Ron, and so guided. Thank you.
Yes. Please proceed. Most grateful, Your Honor. Um, Your Honors, if I might first be permitted to contextualize the matter before the court. I will immediately agree with um, Learned Senior for the appellant that the genesis of this matter is found in the letter dated March 5, 2010 from the Guyana Securities Council to the appellant, please, calling on the appellant to, among other things, register as a reporting issuer since its shareholding exceeded 50 persons. In relation to that letter, which appears at page 51 of the record, I, I had access to please your honors. Um, I wish to make three points. First, um, the appellant did seek in 2003 to register as a public issuer, but in view of the council, it was not qualified. Two, the 2007 register of the appellant had in excess of 50 shareholders, and by dint thereof, um, the appellant was classified in view of the council as a public company, and three, the appellant complied with section 58 of the Securities Industry Act, which requires, please, Your Honor, that reporting issuers submit on an annual basis, among other things, uh, their annual returns. So these three facts are undisputed, please, Your Honors. And it is this that formed the basis of, of the matter presently before this court. Now, the submissions filed by the appellants, please, do call on this honorable court to take an approach to the interpretation of section 32F of the Securities Industry Act, which is transactional. It is our respectful submission, please, Your Honor, that section 32F allows for two disjunctive uh, qualifications, please, Your Honors, that would call or cause a company to be classified as a public company. The section, if I might be permitted to read this section it's in its entirety, it appears at page 163, which is the first page of submissions filed by the respondent, please, Your Honor. It says that public company means a company, A, any of whose issued shares or debentures are or were part of a distribution or an offer to the public, or B, that is the issuer of a security that is beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. Now, this appeal, please, Your Honors, is concerned not with the first qualification, that of there being a distribution to the public, but rather the second, that there exists in the appellant beneficial ownership in a security which exceeds 50 persons. Now, His Honor Justice Jamadar did inquire whether any searches were done in the Hansard in relation to this matter. And I must confess, please, that initially our view was and it remains that this section is sufficiently clear so as to not to engage the exception in Pepper and Hart. But this notwithstanding, we have considered, please, several regulations which were passed after this act came into operation. And among those regulations, please, are regulations which were gazetted on the 22nd of July, 2002, in the official Gazette of Guyana, which do not form part of this court's record, but which we have had regard to um, in light of the question posed by His Honor Justice Jamadar. And if the court would indulge me very briefly, just to read paragraph three of the explanatory note, which appears at page 525, of the Gazette to which I have alluded, please. It says that it should be noted from- Just a minute, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Sorry, um, did you Did you share this document with the other side? Your Honor, I intend to share this document across to, to the registrar and with my friends immediately after my submissions. I am precluded from doing so right now as I have it in hard copy and I'm having it scanned. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the paragraph three to which I referred reads, it should be noted that from the commencement of part five of the act, all public companies automatically become reporting issuers. A public company is defined by section 32B of the act as meaning a company and the, the section goes through the definition that I've already cited, please, Your Honor. 
That is that there has been a distribution of shares or debentures um, or an offer to the public or B, that the issue of a security, that you're an issue of a security rather that is beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. Your Honor, I do have the scan and I will be sharing this with my friend as soon as my submissions um, are, are completed. I just got it, otherwise I would have sent it before. But if Your Honor might permit me- Mr. To... Roberts, just, just help me with one thing. Now, Certainly, you say several regulations were passed after the act and they were gazetted. Yes, so this para three is from, because you said several, yes, this para three is from, can you give us the legal <laughs> notice number, legal notice X of what? Number because, eight, because you said several. Mm -hmm. Certainly, please, Your Honor. It is number eight of 2002. Number eight of... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. So that, Your Honor, the position of the Guyana Securities Council is and was that from the time the appellant company had a shareholding which exceeded 50 persons, by virtue of that shareholding, please, Your Honor, the appellant company did become a public company and is therefore obliged to comply with Section 56.1 of the Securities Industry Act. Now, I Counsel. do know... Counsel. Sorry. Yes, Your Honor. Sorry. Uh, are you suggesting that um, shareholding is uh, synonymous with um, beneficial ownership? Not at with all, please, Your Honor. Oh, you, you'll, you'll explain later. Your Honor, I must confess that neither the submissions prepared and filed by the respondent nor the submissions filed by the appellant consider, please, Your Honor, the definition of the term beneficial ownership. I have, Your Honor, um, the benefit of definitions supplied by the Black's Law Dictionary, which I would be more than happy to walk through with this honorable court. Um, All right, but, but, but Mr. Roberts, before before you before you go there, I just want to stay with Mr. With, with Justice Burgess's question because three two F two, the focus is on beneficially owned. There, there's a singular plural argument that Mr. Jonas has raised. I assume you'll deal with that, but just for the moment, is the issue of a security? that is beneficially owned by more than, which is what I think Justice Burgess is trying to bring to your attention. So that even though you say you all did not address it, we accept that in its on its plain language, what on your interpretation, it must be 50 persons who beneficially owned. You agree? Yes, Your Honor. All right, yeah, okay. Your so Honor, that if, if 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 you don't meet that, do is it uh, does it fall within the definition? No, please, Your Honor. No, and, okay. And right. Your Honor, to further um, address um, Your Honor Justice Jam Justice Burgess's question directly, um, I will readily concede that there is a distinction between legal ownership and beneficial ownership, but it does stand to reason, please, Your Honors, that if there has been um, or rather there are shares in the hands of an excess of 50 persons, that the beneficial ownership of those shares resides in at least one person. Um, I will also readily concede, please, Your Honors, that there is no evidence before, there was no evidence before the trial judge as to the extent of the beneficial ownership of each of the shares, um, which are now um, under consideration, please, Your Honors. However, I, I must repeat my previous point, which is that there being a shareholding in excess of 50 persons, it does stand to reason that there was beneficial ownership um, residing in more than 50 persons, which forms the basis upon which the, the letter of March 5, 2010 was issued. I am not sure if I have adequately addressed Your Honor's question and whether no. I can proceed. Counsel, counsel I'm, not, I'm not too certain where it stands to reason. Uh, you can have nominee shareholders, shareholders who are trustees, shareholders in the position as explained by Mr. Jonas earlier this morning and so on. So um, uh, is there any principle that you can point us to uh, which would help us to conclude that when once you have 51 shareholders, uh, you have um, uh, examples of beneficial ownership by more than 50? Your Honor, let me, permit me first to say, please, 
that when a share has been issued, um, the court can readily accept that the share certificate would be issued to the individual or individuals who legally own the shares. Um, and pr proceeding on that premise, please, Your Honor, the beneficial ownership in those shares for which a share certificate has been issued must reside somewhere. Now, I do accept that there can be nominee shareholders. I also accept that shares can be held on trust. But when we speak to beneficial ownership, please, Your Honor, we speak to the ultimate beneficial ownership, which must be or is some natural person or legal person. So that you know, I, I take the court's point um, and I, I state in return, please, Your Honor, that it is impossible for a legal interest to exist um, in a security, as is the subject of the instant appeal, absent uh, beneficial ownership at all, please, Your Honor. And I don't believe that canvassed before this court is any document which suggests that there was not beneficial ownership, um, please, Your Honor, uh, in the shares which are presently at issue. And what we are most concerned with, please, Your Honor, is whether the council was correct or incorrect in characterizing this particular company on the basis of that shareholding, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Your Honors, we have considered, please, the definition provided of the term public company in section 32F2 of the Securities Industry Act. And much has been made, please, Your Honor, of the distinction between the characterization in section 32F1 and 32F2 being that in 32F1, there's a reference made explicitly to shares or debentures, which are or were part of a distribution or offer to the public. Whereas uh, in distinction as propounded by the appellant, the 32F2 is concerned with the singular security and what is suggested, please, by the appellants is that there can only be an application of 32F2 in circumstances where the beneficial ownership of a single security resides in 50 or more persons. I wish to say, state two things in relation to this, please. Uh, Her Honor, Madam Justice Rajnath Lee did allude to the definition of the term security in the Securities Industry Act. And that definition, please, Your Honors, is expressed in the singular with one exception, please. The term security is defined in the Securities Industry Act to mean expressed singularly, please, a bond debenture in subparagraph A, a share, stock, or unit in subparagraph B, and I'm not reading the entire section as I'm, I'm, I don't propose to consume too much of your honor's time. Um, in subsection C, an instrument commonly known as A security. In subsection D, an instrument or document evidencing of or any interest or participation in a profit sharing agreement, trust, etc. And in subparagraph E, please your honors, the, the plural is used, units and collective investment schemes including shares in or securities of an open-ended investment company. And then we go on to subparagraphs F and G, also expressed to be in the singular. Now, Your Honors, the reason for considering how the act itself defined the term security is first to suggest to this honorable court that the term does not by and of itself exclude uh, the plural consideration or interpretation. And secondly, please, Your Honor, to point to a certain degree of absurdity which would obtain if it were that the subsection 32F2 were confined to the singular security in its most strict sense. And the reason for this, please, Your Honors, in preparation of the submissions filed before this honorable court, we have considered in detail the nature of securities transactions in Guyana which per Your Honor's ruling in the Rocille Services Limited and Chalice forms part, please, Your Honor, of the historical context against which um, statute 
ought to be considered and interpreted. And we were hard pressed, please your honors, to find any single security in which there existed a beneficial ownership that exceeded 50 persons. Now, I immediately confess that this could have been by dint of, of, of poor research, but I do not readily concede that. And I, I might even venture to say, please your honors, that the intention of parliament when this particular section was drafted and indeed passed could not have been to confine its operation strictly to any single security beneficially owned by 50 or more persons. It suggests, please, Your Honor, that in this instance, a share can be split some 50 ways, or rather the beneficial ownership can be split some 50 ways. And my difficulty, please, Your Honors, if the court would permit, is that the concept of beneficial ownership does engage, please, Your Honors, the fact that the majority of the equitable interest um, that can be exercised in a particular form of property is exercised by that beneficial owner. So that in an, in, in an instance where there are 50 beneficial owners, um, it, it, can't, it can't be said that any, any of those 50 persons or collectively those 50 persons exercise the majority of the equity or interest um, in the particular uh, uh, security as it were. So that please your honors, my humble submission would be that this section 32F2 cannot be confined as is being suggested by the appellant to the singular um, share. And the other um, reason- uh, before, you, before you move on there, Mr. Roberts, if I may, please. Yes, Madam Judge. Yes, um, you, you've looked at the uh, Roman one, two to five under T, which is yes, the definition of security. Could you look at the opening words of, of that and uh, uh, perhaps the question that Justice Burgess, my colleague, put to Mr. Jonas about the share capital, could that be a security? Would you be in a position to address us on that? Have a regard to what is here as the definition of security? Your Honor, I am not sure that the definition of the term security is so wide as to capture the term share capital. I think, please, Your Honor, is that in both our submissions, we have alluded to the catch and exclude uh, principle of interpretation of securities legislation, such that absent uh, an explicit reference in this particular definition section, I would be hard pressed to say that it explicitly includes the term share capital, but this notwithstanding, at the second, um, the second subdivision in the definition of the term security, which alludes to any document or record evidencing ownership, there is, please, Your Honor, the terms share, stock, unit, unit certificate, participation certificate, or certificate of share or interest. Now, if I were to take the term interest and apply it very widely, then perhaps uh, the term share capital could be subsumed there under. But I think, please, Your Honor, that the import of this definition section is to cater to the exact document or categories of document evidencing the existence of the, of the, um, of the security, please. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure unless the court were to accept that the term interest assumes that that share capital. I'm not sure that the um, other subcategories explicitly provide therefore, Your Honor. I, I, I hear what you say and I understand what you're saying. I, I just wanted for myself to understand exactly wh when the section says security means any document or record evidencing ownership or any interest in the capital, uh, et cetera, of any enterprise. Uh, what, what do you, in your submission, Mr. Roberts, is that referring to? Your Honor, well, in this instance, and pointing to the, the more general portion of the definition, um, again, I, I, I can accept, please, Your Honor, that this can allude to share capital of a private or public company insofar as the word capital or debt is used. Um, but in so, 
and again, the while the section does set out specific um, subcategories, as it were, um, the section is somewhat prescribed by use of the words without limiting the generality of the foregoing. So perhaps, please, Your Honor, it can be properly said that the term share capital is included by dint not of the subcategories and the, the numerous documents alluded to, but the use of the word capital. Um, if the court were to view the share capital as representing the capital of the um, of a company, public or private. I think, Mr. Roberts, um, what uh, Mr. Jonas is suggesting to you is that your construction of F2 would render the interpretation to be the same as if the legislature had said it means a company, public company means a company that is the issuer of securities that are beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. It, does it trouble you that that is the case, that there would be no distinction between what is there and an interpretation that pluralizes everything, changes security to securities, and is to a. Does, does, does that bother you? Um, your Honor, before I answer your question, might I ask if it would be correct to say that if, or rather, is it correct to interpret the court's question as more or less muddling A and B? So to suggest that subsection 32F1 and 32F2 would carry the same meaning if it is that the term security is accorded a, a plural interpretation. Is that what I'm, is it, is it correct to understand your honor that way? No, no uh, well, I understand you to say, and I, I, I make no comment on, re, on or the other in evaluating it, but I understand you to say that F2 is aimed at companies that issue securities that are beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. Now, what Mr. Jonas is saying is that that is a, 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 uh, a misapprehension of and a distortion of the provision because the provision actually says the issue of a, and I put in the word single, by way of emphasis, security that is beneficially owned. And what he says is that what it is intended to capture is a company that issues a single security and the person to whom that security is issued then does something to render that security to become beneficially owned by more than 50 persons. And I would just like your comment on the um, on, on, on that submission. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the submission that this particular section ought to be accorded some form of transactional interpretation, which I understand um, Mr. Jonas is suggesting, um, is flawed, please, Your Honor, in our humble view, on the basis that there's a, there's a distinction between this subparagraph 32F2 and subparagraph 32F1. In the subparagraph 32F2, there is an emphasis place on, placed on this threshold of 50 or more persons who have a beneficial ownership in a security. Now, Your Honor, I would venture to say, please, that if the intention of Parliament were to focus on the means by which these 50 persons obtain their interest beneficially in the single security, um, then perhaps the section would have been explicitly worded that way. 
Um, Your Honor, the other suggestion I, I would venture to make, please, is that there are very few uh, sophisticated transactions that would result in beneficial ownership being exercised over a single security like a share in a private company or in a public company in Guyana, please. Um, and Your Honor, I am at pains to highlight to this honorable court any such single transaction so that, Your Honor, if it is that we were to accord this 32F2 such a limited and restricted definition, then the section would ultimately be meaningless. Our reading of the sections 32F1 and 32F2 are this, please, Your Honor, that in the instance of 32F1, you can distribute to the public 20 shares. You offer those 20 shares to the public. By application of this 32F1, insofar as that offering is a public offering, that is an offering to the public of shares as fits squarely in this definition, then you are a public company. Coming to the second limb of the definition, please, Your Honor. In other words, there's no threshold. Mr. Roberts, theoretically, if you offer two shares, it matters not. What is important for F1 is the public offering of. Yes, please, not, Your Honor. Not the number. So the, you become a public company because you do these two acts. That is, you offer to the public, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, Your the Honor. The number of offerings are irrelevant. It is the fact of the offering to the public that qualifies yes, you. And in the second one, the focus is not on whether you make an offer or not. The focus is for the legislature is 50 or more persons who have prima facie, can I introduce those words, for the purpose of the, of, 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 of the respondent, prima facie a beneficial interest. Yes, Your Honor, that is exactly If it is what known I'm to the saying. respondent that 50 persons do not have a beneficial interest, or I assume, if when you make the demand for registration, it is brought to your attention uh, in a credible, through credible means, that in fact, 50 or more persons do not have, again, underlining Justice Burgess's emphasis, a beneficial interest, then there is no qualification. Exactly, Your Honor. Yeah. And that's the end of the day. That's the end of it for you all. That's as simple as it is. That is exactly as, as, as we view it, please, Your Honor. I, I think I heard one of your brothers or your sister um, asking a question. I'm not sure whether I'm at liberty to proceed, please. No, please go ahead unless and until somebody uh, interrupts. Thank you so much, Your Honor. Now, Your Honor, the only other term which bears consideration in the interpretation of this subsection 3 to F2 is the use of the word issue. Because as your honors will recall that the focus here is whether the company in question is the issue of a security. Um, and the act provides a useful definition of that very term, issue. And where it that definition, please, your honor, is so wide as to capture both a private or public arrangement. And so far as the term issue is defined in that very uh, definition section to mean a person that has securities outstanding or issues or proposes to issue a security. So this necessarily would cover a situation where a private company, by way of private treaty, by way of sale, um, by way of exchange, has its shares um, issued to its, its shareholders, private or not. It would also cater to the situation where a public company makes an offering to the public, be that by way of subscription, be that by way of issuing a prospectus um, or whatever form it takes. But that is, that is what this section is, is catered to. Now, as part of this honorable court's record, and I'm embarrassed as I do not have the page number, is the actual share, um, the annual return of the appellant, which was filed um, with the council and is dated the 31st of December, 2009. Um, 
might I inquire whether I can be heard? It, it seems as though my screen is frozen. No, I'm hearing you fine. Thank you, Your Honor. So that this share register, which forms part of the court's record, contains a listing of some 60 persons, both natural and company. And of this listing of 60 persons, please, Your Honors, there's listed the names of about 16 companies. Now, I am not suggesting that the inclusion of companies as part of your um, shareholding ipso facto renders you public or ipso facto renders uh, or creates a situation where there was an offer to the public. What I am saying is that the share register upon which the letter dated March 5, 2010 was issued did exhibit, please, a shareholding which exceeded 50 persons. And we have not, in relation to that letter dated March 5, 2010, received any information which satisfied the council that there was not the threshold requirement in the section 32F2. Now, coming back, please, Your Honor, to the context against which we say this section and indeed the, the appeal should be um, considered. Turning to the grounds of appeal, please, Your Honor, that were filed by the appellant and appear at page one of this court's record um, and paragraph two thereof at page two. The grounds all relate, please, Your Honor, to this question of whether or not the appellant company was properly classified as a public company and thereafter the consequences that flow therefrom. The suggestion, please, Your Honor, that there was and is an emphasis on the section 56 one um, requirement to register as a reporting issuer and thereafter to comply with the filing requirements there under um, is not apparent on the face of, a re of the reading of grounds A through C of the grounds of appeal before this honorable court. But this notwithstanding, I do recall that Your Honor's placed a great deal of emphasis on the use of the term from the commencement of this act as it appears in section 56.1 of the Securities Industry Act. Our suggestion, please, Your Honors, in relation to the manner in which that ought to be read is consistent even, please, Your Honor, with the explanatory note which I, I read to this court and which I will be sharing shortly, um, which, please, Your Honor, tends towards a reading of an ongoing obligation, being that if a company by virtue of 32F1 or 32F2 becomes a public company, it must comply with section 56. Our interpretation of, of that section 56 and the interpretation which we would propose to this honorable court is that the term from the commencement of this act literally speaks to the date from which that part five of the act should speak and not please your honor to a temporal restriction as to when any person should view the obligation to comply with section 56 as arising. Again, such an, a reading and such an interpretation would render that section 56.1 nugatory. It would only relate to the companies which existed at the time that the act was um, commenced and thereafter its effect is meaningless. Now, I, I do understand- Mr. Mr. Roberts, before you go off, because this is something that I'm curious about. Is it correct that 56.1 is the only subsection that on the face of it deems public companies reporting issuers, and I'm using reporting issuers as a term of art, forget about shall within the 90 days, in other words, your letter in 2010 was requiring of the appellant registration because it had become a reporting issuer, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Right. So 56.1 speaks to all public, I'm just truncating it, uh, not to get into the questions of, con of, of commencement and 90 days for now, all public companies shall become reporting issuers. 
and file a registration statement. Agreed? Yes, Your Honor. Now, are there any other sections or subsections that speak to that matter? That is to say, public companies becoming reporting issuers in all of the legislation. Your Honor, I would first turn again to the definition section of the Act, mm -hmm. which says, please, Your Honor, in relation to the term reporting issuer, that mm -hmm. reporting issuer means an issuer that has filed a registration statement on the Section 56 and has not been the subject of an order of the Council altering its status as a reporting issuer. No, no, um, I, I get that. But, so, it's, but the definition tags it into 56, you see. Yes, Your Honor, I was just... Okay, right. So let's it. just stay with the question for a little while. Is there any section other than 56.1 that speaks to the uh, status, duty of a public company becoming a reporting issuer? Your Honor, other than section 56... Yes. Uh, the import of part five of the act in which section 56 um, reads speaks broadly to the obligations of of a reporting issue please your honor but as to class yes yes exactly honor, yes. I, was, I was getting to your your, mm -hmm. your question but as to actually classifying a public company as a reporting issue i, I would venture to say that we are confined to to section 56 one okay agreed so that, that's my own but I just want to make sure that I have missed something. So therefore, 56.1, taking it in its whole context now, says from the date of commencement of this part, that's 2002, I'm imagining, or public companies shall become reporting issuers and shall within 90 days from that date file the registration statement in the prescribed form. Yeah? Yes, Your Honor. That's what it says. Well, what does that mean on the face of it? Your Honor, I would venture to say that it means two things. Mm -hmm. Firstly, from the date of commencement of this part, so the literal date upon which this part commenced, um, public companies were obliged to file their um, registration statement within the 90-day period prescribed by the Act, by that section. I'd also venture to say, please, Your Honor, that it also means that all public companies have this obligation to file their registration statement. The reference to the 90 days from that date, please, Your Honor, um, would relate, I think, to those companies who would have been public as at the date of the commencement of this act. But the reading of that particular temporal restriction that way does not confine this particular section 56.1 to companies which existed at the time of the commencement of the act. Because if it did, given that this was the only subsection, it would mean that only public companies existing as of 2002 would have this obligation of being a reporting issuer. Precisely. Right. You say that is absurd because the whole point of this legislation is to make these public companies reporting issuers and bring them under the regime of the legislation. Yes, please, Your Honor. And, and I'd even take it a step further. The marginal note in that very section 56 and, and reading contiguous with section 56.1 is registra registration statement of issuers, um, which to my mind, please, Your Honors, points us in the direction of an activity which gives rise to classification as a as a public company um in this instance that would be that you fall within the the three two f definition whether it for whether you fall on the on the one or two but but that is the suggestion being made as to this interpretation your honor well i i i think to be fair to mr jonas while he is suggesting that 56 one that's my understanding and he would correct me if i'm wrong in his response well, 56.1 relates only to public companies in existence at the date 2002. Um, public companies are also caught by 56.2, so that if a company proposes 
to issue securities to the public, then it shall similarly register as a reporting issuer. Um, so that it it is, my understanding is that the appellants are saying that 56.1 relates to companies in existence as of 2002, has nothing to do with companies that come into existence after 2002. And those latter companies are governed by 56.2 so far as they are public and they have a requirement to register as a reporting issuer. Can I please, can I please, uh, President? Yes. Yeah, uh, Council, what is bothering me uh, in relation to Section 56.1 is this. A company after the 90, 90 days have expired, how does it comply with um, 56.1? How can a company after that, those 90 days which are mentioned in 56.1, after they have passed, how does a company now uh, obey 56.1? Could you help me to to see what a company does? Your Honor, I, I think if we're speaking, sorry, am I understanding, Your Honor, to speak to that period at the commencement of the act yes. or at that present day? Sorry, what, 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 perhaps I should explain myself a little, a little more. The section says that all public companies within a period of 90 days from the date of the commencement of the act must register. Am I right in, in, in understanding that way? Now, assuming the 90 days have passed, how does a company which has 51 uh, uh, shareholders, how does it comply with section 56.1? That's what is giving me uh, I, pause. Yeah. I, I think that that question is answered in section 58, um, which says a reporting issuer shall, within four months after the end of its financial year, A, file with the council a copy of its annual report containing the information prescribed by the council and any other any other information that is not of a type prohibited by regulation and be sent to each of its security holders such financial statements as the council may prescribe. And then 58.2, a report in this year shall file such other reports in such form as may be prescribed. So that 58 gives the continuing obligation of a public company, because a public company is the same thing as a reporting issuer. If you interpret 56.1 to mean that all public companies are deemed by this act to be reporting issuers. I, I, I'm not certain that I, that, that I uh, understand 56.1 any better in light of 58. Uh, with all due respect, the, the, the 56 1 stipulates that you have to become a reporting issuer. When once you've done that, I understand the president's position, which is that certain obligations fall on you, including the obligation under uh, 58. But before the obligation under 58 can, can fall on you, you have to satisfy 56. And 56 has limited itself by saying that uh, you register within 90 days of the commencement of the of the act. I I, I don't know, Councillor. Uh, perhaps 56, 58 explains it. But could you marry the two for me in such a way as to help me to understand how a company will? comply with 56.1 after the 90 days? Your Honor, I'd first venture to say that the obligation on the part of a company as at the date of commencement of, of the act and this particular section is as Your Honor has rightly identified, um, that within 90 days there's this obligation to register as a reporting issue in the manner prescribed by the act. I'd venture to say, please, Your Honor, that the failure 
or rather the consequence of a company failing to be registered as a reporting issuer um, under this section 56 within that 90 day period is that such a company is in immediately in violation of the act. And it does seem to me, please, Your Honor, having regard to this particular case, that failing to, um, to register as a reporting issuer has, has one, of two, um, one of two consequences. Either the penal provisions of this act would kick in and, and the errant company would be subject to, to some form of prosecution, or as has been done in, in this particular instance, an opportunity is accorded to the um, company at issue to immediately register, which to my mind seems to be the consequence um, or, or seems to be the action that was taken by the council in this particular case in relation to, to this company. Now, as to the, the section 58, um, that section, please, Your Honor, ties back to this section 56 insofar as they both speak to an, a, a registration requirement, save that in section 58, that registration requirement is ongoing. That is to say that there's a requirement to file the annual reports within the time periods prescribed by that section. Your Honor, but I would also venture to, to, to highlight to Your Honor, section 57. Now, what section 57 calls on, on a public company to do would be to register the actual individual security that is being offered to the public. And that registration requirement, please, Your Honor, is not prescribed by the 90-day period, which has been alluded to by His Honor um, on the Section 56.1. So that, Your Honor, the, the dilemma that Your Honor has identified, I think, is cured by the Act itself. You obviously can't make an offer to the public if that security being offered hasn't been registered in the manner prescribed by the Act. And Assuming that you have complied with that section 57 registration requirement, you continue to have this ongoing obligation to file your annual returns and do all the other matters um, as are set out in, in section 58. Um, I'm not sure if your honor still has pause and wishes me to- No, I, I, I was just wondering, I was just wondering aloud whether uh, all that you're saying, which is, relate, which is relating to um, uh, 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 reporting issue, uh, whether all that you've said doesn't fall on the 56.2. 56.1 away. I'm just wondering aloud, doesn't it fall away after the 90 days? And then you, uh, as Mr. Jonas, I think, uh, sought to argue, and then you find your, you, you, you can register uh, on the, or you must register on the uh, 56 too, as long as there's a public offer. Uh, respectfully, no, please, Your Honor, because my, my difficulty with, with reading the section that way is that it would mean, please, Your Honor, that there is really no consequence in, in being a public company. If we are to accept that all public companies are reporting issuers, and if we are to also accept that a public company, you can become a public company if you have crossed this 50 shareholder beneficial ownership threshold, then there must be, please, Your Honor, a consequence of you being public. And if we, we keep in mind, please, Your Honor, that the very purpose of, of this legislation and indeed Section 56, 1 and 2 would be to ensure that public companies are regulated in the absence of a public company filing a registration statement with the, the Guyana Securities Council. There is absolutely no way for the council to regulate that company in the manner prescribed by the act. Now, I readily accept that a company, not mm -hmm. being a securities company, but an ordinary company has certain filing requirements with the company's registrar and the council perhaps can access documentation there. But the requirements that are, as, are set out in this section 56 and flowing thereafter are a bit more stringent. They allow the council, for instance, please, Your Honor, to pick up any insider dealings, to, to, to be able to determine the relationship between the several shareholders and the company itself, to be able to access the manner in which the shares or, or security offered by the particular company are being exchanged, to look into the, the transactions and to regulate them. So that, please, Your Honor, 
while I, I hear your honor in relation to 56.2, I do not um, concede, please, that that section 56.1 is as temporal as to confine itself only to the period that is um, around the, the commencement date of, of this act. Now, Mr. Robert, Mr. Roberts, um, I think the submission is that in that first period of 90 days after the commencement of the of this this act, in those in those in that period, uh, the trust company was not a public company because even if we follow your definition, uh, there were not there were less than 50 shareholders in that period. So following the interpretation uh, that you uh, want to, us to see, um, um, following that interpretation, um, it became a public company one, once it had more than 50 shareholders. That was after this period. So in a case like that, what is a company supposed to do in accordance with this legislation? It was not a, a public company, according to the definition, in that first period of 90 days. Sorry, right? your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Sorry, Your Honor, you, you broke up ever so slightly, so I don't think oh. I heard the end of your, your question. Okay, so the question is, if what is the company supposed to do if it becomes a public company after that first 90 days? Your Honor, my humble suggestion is that the obligation on such a company would be to immediately register as a reporting issuer, since at, as at the point that you satisfy the, the, the characterization of a public company under the Act, you have an immediate obligation to comply. Um, I, I think, Your Honor, that in instances such as, as this Section 56.1, and indeed, in instances where legislation generally creates new obligations, Parliament, in its wisdom, does allow for a grace period within which um, compliance can be um, can be done, uh, since what is being required is, is novel. But in an instance such as this, please, Your Honour, where 18 years after the commencement of the Act, um, there is an obligation to to do a particular thing. Um, any person obliged to comply with the provisions of the Act is deemed to have sufficient notice of, of the existence of the legislation and is therefore obliged to comply. Um, if the suggestion being made by Your Honor is that it, it may be unreasonable to accord the provision such an interpretation um, due perhaps to impossibility of immediate performance, your Honor, then I might say that what we have in our hands is, is a drafting difficulty, which ought to be cured by, by the very authors of the Act. But to superimpose on, on the Act um, restrictions and our provisions that, that aren't there, I, I think might be a little unfair and might be a misreading of, of, of the provisions of the Act. Mr. Roberts, can I ask you two questions? Um... For, for your argument to, to, to make sense, section 56 will have to, one will have to be read uh, to mean from that date, that date would mean the date of commencement or the date and or the date at which a company became a public company. That is a fair suggestion, yes, Your Honor. Because otherwise, the 90 days just becomes issues after the commencement of the act. The, 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 in other words, for your your interpretation would lead to a construction that says, from the date of commencement of this part, all public companies shall become reporting issues and shall, within 90 days from the date of the commencement or the date at which a company became a public company, file with the Council a registration statement in the prescribed form. And that would therefore create an obligation on as of 2002, within 90 days of the Act, for all public companies to register, and thereafter, on an ongoing basis, for any company that became a public company, as in this case, you say, uh, within 90 days to do the same. Is, is, is that the meaning that you are contending 
56 should be read and interpreted as meaning? Yes, Your Honor. Um, okay. and you're, so, yeah. So yeah. the second thing I want to ask you is this registration statement in a prescribed form, where I, I maybe I have not looked for it properly, but where is that form? Where is that to be found? What is the information in that? Do, is that is that attached to this act or in some regulation somewhere? Your Honor, I believe it does form part of the regulations passed with the act. I, I believe my version of the act has a, a copy of the form. I'm not sure whether Your Honor's version may oh, not have okay. it. Okay. Uh, is it an um, appendix to the act then? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up. And, and Your Honor, if I may, um, in, in relation to Your mm -hmm. Honor's question, Your Honor, okay, if we... I don't have it, yeah. Go on, sorry. I was just you, saying my, my act doesn't have it, but go on, yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, if we if we read section 56.1 this way, so the date of commencement of the of this part simply would mean the date at which this part of the act becomes operable. And then we go to the very next sentence appearing after that comma. All public companies shall become reporting issuers and shall within 90 days from that date, as Your Honor has, has suggested, that date being the date of commencement or the date after you have become a reporting issuer. Now, Mr. Uh, Roberts, just be clear, I'm not suggesting anything. No, no, no. You know. I'm trying to understand your argument and put it in a, in, in a way that I can understand. I understand that that is how you are asking us to interpret it, all right? Your Honor, that's what I'm trying to clarify. Agree. Yeah. Your, maybe apologies. I maybe I agree, but for now I'm just asking. Your Honor, my apologies for mischaracterizing. I, I just wanted to get the point out before I forgot it. Um, um but essentially what I am suggesting is is just that. That okay. that reference to the date is either the commencement or the date after which you've become a public company. And the means by which you've become a public company is is, is immaterial. It's either you fall within the first or the second category. And can I just go one step further? Therefore, 56.1, which speaks to public companies, which for you is at the heart of 56.1, 56.2 now speaks, it chooses not to speak about public companies. It speaks about a person who proposes to issue, etc., etc. right? Yes, Your Honor. Now, of course, in law, a person can be a company. Yes, Your Honor. But the language in two, for whatever reason, chooses not to say a public company or a person who proposes to issue securities. So any entity, legal person, who proposes to issue securities shall also do a similar thing. Also is deemed to become a reported issuer status. A, B, has an obligation to file a capital RS registration statement in the form and C, within a, a time, whereas in the first is 90 days, in the second case is within the prescribed time, yeah? Yes, Your Honor. So, again, I'm just asking a question because I want to understand you. Do you, is it then for you that a person means any entity and can include, um, so, so what, what, how do you interpret person in relation to public companies in one? And B, within the prescribed time, where is that prescribed? Has that been prescribed? Because I'm, I'm saying that both sections create a status, an obligation to do something, B, within a prescribed form, according to a prescribed form, and C, to do so within prescribed times in in one 90 days in two within a prescribed time so there are three uh repeating elements to one and two i'm yes, asking you two questions about two what is your interpretation of person in relation to public companies above or otherwise and b what is the prescribed where is this within the prescribed time uh, clarification to be found. What is it? Thank you, Your Honor. Now, in relation to the first limb of Your Honor's question, um, that the interpretation to be accorded to the word person um, relative to, to public companies um, or private companies, the, the, the term person here, please, Your Honor, would include 
any entity that is proposing to issue securities matters not whether that entity is public or private. In fact, if the entity... It doesn't even have to be a company. It doesn't have to be a company. But okay. even, even where, please, Your Honor, a, a private company is desirous of issuing a security in the manner described by this Section 56.2, there is a registration requirement. Agreed. And there is a recharacterization of of such a company. So person here is, is both natural or, or artificial, please, Your Honor. And the status um, becomes reporting issuer. That's his status. Yes, Your Honor. Conferred status, right? Um, to, to the second element of, of your um, question, please, Your Honor. That is, what is the prescribed time within which one ought to, to comply with this, um, this particular subsection? Your Honor, I, I don't have the benefit of all my regulations before me. Okay. But when a prospectus is being offered, particularly where there is a public offering being made, as is contemplated by this section 56.2, the regulations themselves do prescribe the manner in which certain things ought to be done and the time within which, um, the time for compliance, more or less, please, Your Honor, because there's a <laughs> wide power <laughs> in section 126, I believe, of the act for the Minister of Finance to, to provide for regulations under this act. So I think what this particular section would be alluding to, please, Your Honor, is any regulation passed by the appropriate body, which would govern the particular um, period. And if I might direct, Your Honor, to the exact regulation at issue here, um, it is to be found again in the Gazette of the 22nd day of July, 2002, and at, at section two, subparagraph three thereof, please, Your Honor. This is the Registration of Issuers of Securities Regulations 2002. It is annexed to the Act, please, Your Honor. What it says is that for the purposes of section 56.2 of the Act, the registration statement shall be filed at least 28 days prior to the date of the issue of the securities. This is this is actually part of the, the regulations passed under the act to which I have alluded, Your Honor. So that is the prescribed time um, that this particular section would, would allude to. Two small things on that, Mr. Roberts. One, yes, you sir. will no doubt send that to the court and Certainly, to your good Honor. friend, Mr. Jonas, president, if that is convenient. Yes, by all and means. And secondly, I see in the definition section that prescribed means prescribed by regulations of the council. So I take your point. Yes, please, Your Honor. I, yes. I'd be more than happy to supply the court with a full copy of the act. I, I'd admit that there is some difficulty in, in actually locating some of it. Thank you. Yes, please proceed, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Your Honor. I was just affording His Honor Justice Jamadar an opportunity to ask a further question. I wasn't sure. No, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Complete. Uh, Thank may you. I ask uh, a question here? Um, now, if a company is a public company only because there are more than 50 shareholders, uh, if at some point uh, that number of shareholders dwindles below 450, uh then automatically the company is not a public company anymore your honor the answer to your question resides in section 56 6, six yes correct um which states that where reporting issue ceases to be a public company the council may on its own motion or on application by the issuer or another interested person make an order declaring subject to such conditions as as it considers appropriate that the issue is no longer a reporting issue. So it, it's not necessarily um, automatic, but the act does provide a mechanism whereby a company can be reclassified from public to private. Yeah. And these things would happen, um, everyone would know in real time because of the reporting requirements, at least annually, it should be easily discernible whether a company's shareholding has dropped below or has exceeded the 50 person threshold yes your honor the requirement to report on an annual basis 
Yes, Your Honor. Uh, are these there for Mr. Roberts? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I got Mr. Jonas's submissions right. But would these therefore be only those public companies which could register within that first 90 day that um, Mr. Jonas addressed us on? I, I'm just wondering how that would work if that um, submission would fly, because then would that be the only place, 56 1, where there is an obligation to file? Because 56 2 does not deal with public companies per se. Of course, it deals with persons who propose to issue securities to the public, and they may fit under the definition of public company. So I'm just wondering, Mr. Uh, Roberts, you seem to know the act well, if you're in a position to, to assist. Um, Your Honor, I, I, I'm very sorry. I'm just trying to clearly understand the court's question. Um, if, that's if, that's if, if I may, I think, uh, let me see if I understand what you had said earlier. You said that the appropriate way to interpret 56.1 is to say from the date of commencement of that part, 2002, from that date continuing onwards, all public companies shall become reporting issuers. And secondly, all public companies that become reporting issuers shall within 90 days from becoming reporting issuers file with the council a registration statement in the prescribed, in the prescribed form. That is how I understood you to be interpreting 56.1, am I correct? Yes, please, Your Honor. And, and flowing from that, please, Your Honor, um, to Madam Justice Rajnath Lee's question, um, I do not believe that this section 56.1 um, would be confined to companies who became public as at the date of commencement, and therefore the section 56.6 to which I alluded would apply equally to any company who has become public and is by dint of, of, of some fact cognizable by the act, no longer public, um, as well as any public any company deemed public by operation of section 56.1, which is no longer a, a public company. I, I believe, please, Your Honor, that that is how that would be um, readily addressed. Yeah, I'm just trying to, to, to think about it in terms of what Mr. Jonas addressed us on, but I'm sure when he responds, he, he will amplify that. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Your Honors, I think I have exhausted um, the manner in which we would propose that Section 32F2 of the Securities Industry Act ought to be read, um, which is that there are two bases upon which a company becomes public, um, one being whether there are there is an offer to the public of shares or debentures or two where you have crossed that threshold of 50 beneficial owners in a security um, or humble submission please your honors that the term security is not to be accorded a, a narrow and restrictive interpretation um, but it would embrace please your honor as is the present case shares in a in a company such as the appellant company um, it would flow from, from our submissions, please, Your Honours, that the appellant company is in fact a public company within the meaning of Section 32F2 of the Act. And we would go further to suggest to this Honourable Court that Section 32F2 is less concerned with the transaction by which the um, beneficial ownership in, the, in those shares or in that security um, have accrued, and more with the fact of, of the numbers. I believe, please, Your Honor, that in the submissions that were filed by the appellant, there's a suggestion made that it matters not how many shareholders a private company has or the extent of its um, provided that those shares were not acquired by way of some form of 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 offering to the public. I believe this is found at page 160 of the court's record at paragraph 22 of, of the appellant submissions, um, where the 
appellant suggests that the question of the number of holders of shares in a company is not relevant. If each shareholder purchased a share by a separate private negotiation, that company remains private, even if there were 50 or 10,050 such transactions. I think, please, Your Honor, that, that such a characterization um, is the very mischief against which um, this act is, is seeking to protect persons. It, it certainly can't be said in an instance where there are upwards of 10,000 shareholders in a company that these persons all um, fall within within the, the scope of the, the private company um, types of arrangements um, that this act doesn't necessarily cater to and, and to which this act does provide for certain exceptions. Um, we have also gone through, please, Your Honours, at, at some great extent, the manner in which um, the respondents would suggest that Section 56 ought to be interpreted as imposing in the first instance an obligation to register as a public company at the date of commencement and thereafter, um, at any point in time you become public, to file a registration statement and to comply with Sections 56, 57, and 58 of the Act. Um, Your Honours, unless I can be of further assistance to this court, I believe this would bring me to the end of, of our submissions. Um, just, just before you complete, um, do you know when was Trust Company registered? What year? Um, Your Honour, the Memorandum of Association of this company um, is annexed to the witness statement of Deborah Williams and also to the affidavit of um, affidavit in support of a notice of motion which was filed. The memorandum of association of this company is dated the 17th day of May 1966. So this is a company which would have preceded the legislation and it's continued under the Companies Act, please. Okay. okay. Yeah, council, council, sorry, I think that um, it's 1991, wasn't it? Wasn't it formed in 1991 or 1998? In, in any event, it preceded the promulgation of the act. Sorry, Your Honor, looking at. If, mm -hmm. I, if I might respond to Justice Burgess's question. Um, the trust company Guyana Limited, as, as it is now known, um, is actually uh, the successor to the Royal Bank Trust yes. Company Guyana Limited, which existed as at the date cited of 17th of May. 17th of May 1966, and it was subsequently changed to the Trust Company Guyana Limited um, on what appears to be the 17th day of May 1966, please, Your Honours. Yeah. Mr. Roberts, I see from the annual returns that they filed, um, I'll get the date of that. It says, Date of registration, May 16, 1966, and continued on the 20th of March, 1997. Yes, Your Honor. And that was probably the... That coincides with the New Companies Act, please, Your Honor. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not sure whether I can be of further assistance to Your Honors. Yes, well, thank you very much, Mr. Roberts. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Jonas, is there any reply? Just very briefly, please, sir. I, I listened to my friend, and what is emerging in my mind, possibly because of our training and our background, and um, from law school days and going forward. We have a pre-existing concept of the expression public company. And I think that pre-existing concept necessarily leads to conflating a public company with a reporting issuer. And I think that has led us into error at first instance and in court of appeal. And I hope we avoid that error here. I say that because I, I heard my friend refer to Section 58 of the Act, um, I'm sorry, Section 56 six of the Act, as imposing obligations on public companies. Referring, I, I heard um, Mr. Justice is Saunders. That, is, is, is that conflation, as you put it, done 
by the legislature in 56, section 56, when it says all public companies shall become reporting issuers. Thank you, sir. In section 56, Justice Boy just made the point um, better than I did, and I'm grateful. The words begin from the date of commencement of this part. Your Honor, if we erase those words, that is beyond purposive interpretation. That is changing the meaning of the act. The words begin from the date of commencement. The words say, you, all public companies shall register within 90 days from that date. No, no, it says all public companies shall become reporting issuers. And shall within 90 days from that date file a registration statement. Therefore, sir, any attempt to construe this act as referring to a company which was not a public company at the date of commencement, any intent, any attempt to construe this act to create obligations beyond the 90 days, any attempt to construe the language to apply otherwise than from the date of the commencement, it goes beyond purposive. It changes what this act says in clear language. This act applies to those companies which were public companies at the date of commencement, and it tells them you got 90 days to register. Now, my friend says that if you take that interpretation, which is the literal and only possible interpretation, so, that it renders nugatory when those companies fail to obey. Your Honor, with great respect to him, and Your Honor, allow me please to say that Mr. Roberts is a lawyer of not many years, and his composure and the manner of his presentation was remarkable. Um, however, I disagree with it. And um, I would like to point out, sir, that if we try to introduce some obligation beyond 90 days, we are going outside of the language of this act. Now, an interesting observation came up during your discussion, Your Honours, with regard to section 566. If on the fair, if on the straight language of this act, we are talking about public companies in existence in July 2002, and we give them 90 days, and then that's the end of section 56.1, which I believe is the only way to construe this. We then ask the question in section 56.6, where a reporting issuer ceases to be a public company. And I would like to go there, please, sir, because to me this explains the error in completing a reporting issuer with a public company. Under Section 56.2, a person who proposes to issue securities to the public shall register as a reporting issuer. Your Honours, every person who issues securities to the public becomes a public company within subsection Roman numeral one of the definition. Therefore, as soon as you fall under 56.2, be it in 2010, 2020, but or 10 the years from now. Two, you, you haven't issued it yet, you know. You're only proposing to issue it. Thank you, sir. But section 56.6 contemplates in the timeline that you have proposed to issue it, you have therefore registered as required by the regulations under Section 56.2, and you are therefore now a reporting issuer. So the timelines contemplated in Section 56.6 contemplate in chronological order that you have obeyed the Act, and therefore because you are a reporting issuer, we know you are a public company because you have necessarily fallen within the first limb of the definition of public company, which coincides with Section 56.2. Your Honor, it all fits neatly. The only resistance is in the conflation of this concept of public company and the recognition that if we look at this thing sequentially in chronological order, we know in 2002 your public company register. You got 90 days. We know after that you issue shares to the public register. 
but we also know that if we focus on an expression public company, which we cannot look at neutrally because of our training, we lose sight that this act is about reporting issuers. And my friend is right. A reporting issuer doesn't need to be a company because under, if, you, if, I, if I ask your honest to look at the definition of distribution in, in the act, um, subsection N of the Interpretation Act, distribution contemplates where the company gives, this, gives a single share or a single security to a person and that person resells to the public. That person becomes a reporting issuer and must register and must file a prospectus and must safeguard the investor. So it doesn't just contemplate the single transaction of the issuing company. And I use the expression issuing deliberately because there's no magic in the word issuer. An issuer is anybody who issues shares, but this act isn't about issuers. This act says, a reporting issuer. So if you, the issuer, issue shares to the public, you must register as a reporting issuer. And therefore, the obligations in sections 26 to 1 to 6 to 3 all say an issuer who issues shares to the public, who does this, who does that, because those issuers may or may not be reporting issuers, but as soon as they issue shares to the public within section 56 to they have to register as reporting issuers and fall under the strictures of the Act. And do you, are you saying that they also, by virtue of 32F1, become public companies? All of them, sir. So an individual but, who engages in the 56-2 activity by reason of 32F1, well, under, under 56-2 has to register as a reporting issuer, and by virtue of 32F1, is deemed to be a public company for the purposes of 52.6. By coincidence, yes, sir. He is, a, he, is a, he is a public, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Yes, sir, he is a public company. The By reason, virtue of the definition of 32F1. Oh, yes, please, sir. Right. The reason of the for the definition in 32F2 is to catch the old companies and bring them in. Yeah, yeah, I understand your argument. Thank you. Can I be a further assistance, Your Honor? There is a slight difference, of course, because the definition says a public company means a company, any of whose issued shares or debentures are or were part of a distribution or an offer to the public. So that that looks uh, in the past. They, they issued um, debentures or shares at some point to the public. This is even before that, the person who proposes to issue, he doesn't, he hasn't issued them yet. So he already get, he already becomes a, a, a reporting issuer. But of course, in most cases, he will, after proposing it, he will issue them and then he becomes, if it is a company, a public company. With respect, sir, um, and if we look at the chronological time sequence, which I recognize that your honor has done, he doesn't need to register as a reporting issuer for 28 days. So sequentially, he will conclude his transaction. He proposes, and from the time he proposes, he's got to give all his documents to the Securities Council. Right. But he has 28 days to register, mm -hmm. and therefore becomes a reporting issuer 28 days later. And therefore, even then, sequentially, yeah. on the Section 56.6, mm -hmm. he won't need to deregister. He won't need to stop being a reporting issue unless he has concluded that transaction of issuing the shares. Sure. I'm very grateful, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Yes. Jonas, the only little fly in the ointment in what you've just said is that the definition of public company says, doesn't say it means a person, it says it means a company who has issued shares or debentures. So in the 56-2 scenario where it's not a company, but a person, you say that person becomes a company, a public company, except F in the definition, the sharp to F is public company means a company, not a person. So that, so that in other words, under 56.2, if we are dealing with a person and not a company then, who has 
issue the security. It is not as neat as you make it out to be, I say with respect, because you do not fall within the definition of public company because public company is limited to a company. Yeah, I, I'm glad. But I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on it, Mr. Jonas. It's just an observation. I don't want to keep. Sorry, uh, Justice Burgess. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Justice Zamadari. I think that the point you're making is very, very uh, uh, well made. And I was a bit alarmed to hear uh, Mr. Jonas uh, suggest that a, a market actor who is a, a person would could become a public company. I think that um, I think that you overstated it, and I think that um, uh, Mr. Justice Zamadari is right. The definition uh, in 3F is to the a company, but there are other market actors who could become uh, uh, registered issuers, uh, like for instance, um, uh, uh, brokers and, 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 and other unit uh, trusts and, and so on who could uh, be issuing. So that um, I, I think that that uh, footnote, which um, Mr. Justice Damajar uh, just added it is important because I was very, very worried uh, that you <laughs> had suggested that a person if I said that, without, if I said without, that sorry, incorporation, I did. without incorporation could be a company of any type. I did overreach and your honors, I and respectfully agree with your honor. You must register if you're a broker. You must register if you're a, a sharing house, a distribution house. But only an issuer can become a reporting issuer. And you can't be an issuer unless you got shares to issue. So I, I accept that correction if I did overspeak. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, um, is there anything else, Mr. Jonas, or is that your, are those your submissions? Un unless I can trouble you further, Your Honor, I, I will leave it at that. Okay. All right, so thank you very much, Council. Um, naturally, we will take some time to consider and we would let you know when we are ready with our judgment in this matter. Um, Madam Deputy Registrar, can you bring the proceedings to a close? Thank you, Honourable President. Thank you, Honourable Mr. Justice Witt. Thank you, Honourable Madam Justice Rajnat Lee. Thank you, Honourable Mr. Justice Burgess. And thank you, Honourable Mr. Justice Jamada. Thank you, Council. And thank you, staff of the Caribbean Court of Justice. This court now stands adjourned. Good afternoon to all. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon.